if we could bring up the, the United States flag and do the Pledge of Allegiance, that would be wonderful. All right. I pledge allegiance I to the flag the of the flag United, States, United of America, States of America, to the republic, to the republic, stands, for it to stand, one nation, one nation under, God, under God, indivisible, indivisible with liberty, with liberty and justice to all. all. All right. Great. Uh, if we could get a roll call. Yes. Council Member Dean. Yes. Council Member Barnett. Yeah. Council Member Harrington. Present. Vice Mayor Agramonte. Here. Mayor Harvey. Yep. Uh, here. Present. Sorry. Great. Uh, go ahead and I'll just explain to everybody the public comment uh, actions, especially since we've got new people. Um, we're going to have public comment. I'll just kind of general expl explain around public comment since we've got 44 attendees. Uh, we're going to have a couple public comment sessions. The first one is going to be general public comment. So if you're here for a specific reason that's on the agenda, for example, if you're here to talk about parklets, that first public comment is not for you. That's for items not on the agenda. Then each agenda item is going to have its own public comment section. So just to be clear on that. Uh, secondly, uh, we are operating obviously in a Zoom virtual world type meeting situation. So we are in the future now. Um, and uh, we cannot see you, but hopefully you can see us. We're getting some feedback. Um, it looks like it's ended there. Uh, we can't see any member of the audience, but uh, we're glad that you can see us. Uh, and we won't see you as we bring you in. If you would like to make a public comment, raise your hand virtually on Zoom, uh, or and we because we can't see you. So raise your hand virtually. It looks like Joanna's already gotten that done, so that's great. Um, if you are calling in, go ahead and dial star nine. Additionally, um, as some members of our uh, our participants group already have done, uh, we are allowing people to turn off their cameras. Everybody's operating from their own home. And so you people may have dogs or roommates or children or other things like that running around their house. And so we're allowing people to turn off their cameras if they'd like to. Um, but we are asking that they stay in the room. If they're leaving the room, leaving the Zoom meeting effectively, uh, they will be informing us. There's the potential that we could get Zoom bonds. Somebody could come into the meeting and try to take it over with a bunch of nonsense. Uh, if that does happen, we will go ahead and pause the meeting um, and uh, try to get that person out of here and, uh, and restart the meeting. If that's impossible, we'll start at a later date, but no action will be happening uh, at the meeting if it if we do in fact get zoom bombed and have to shut it back down we'd, we'd restart in the same way all right so it's kind of the coverage for our um public comment process appreciate that uh go ahead and turn it over to our city attorney who's not here i'll turn it over to dave kiff our interim city manager uh for a report out on closed session sure the council discussed ongoing litigation and directed the city attorney to follow a, a process that they agreed to but nothing beyond that is disclosable how wonderful. Thank you. Um, moving on, if we could get an approval of the agenda. Looking for a motion. Move to approve. For approval. Move to approve by Malin. I got a second from Council Member uh, Jack Ding. And if we could get a roll call vote, please. Council Member Ding. Yes. Council Member Barnett. Aye. Council Member Harrington. Aye. Vice Mayor Agravanti? Aye. Mayor Harvey? Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. All right. So we're moving on uh, to comments from the public. So this is our first general public comment session. Uh, at this time, members of the public may comment on any item not appearing on the agenda. It is recommended that you keep your comments to three minutes or less under state law, unless otherwise permitted under the Ralph M. Brown Act. The merits of the matters presented under this item can, cannot be discussed or acted upon by the city council at this time. For items appearing on the agenda, the council will be invited to make, or the public will be invited to make comments at the time this item comes up for con council consideration. Upon being acknowledged by the mayor, that's me, please step into the podium and speak into the microphone or unmute yourself and start speaking here. And again, uh, any comments here should not be on items uh, related to the agenda or on items that are on the agenda. And uh, we cannot act or make any actions or really discuss anything that you bring forward because it needs to be brought to the public before uh, so people can be prepared and make comment on it if they'd like to. So we'll go ahead and open public comment. And we're still getting a bit of feedback. 
So if you are not speaking, you can go ahead and mute your microphone. And it may be me even. So go ahead and. Mayor Harvey, the council members, the council members who aren't speaking are still showing as unmuted. It may be causing a little, if they can mute during why they're not speaking, it might be helpful. So if Jack, Madeline, and Kelso could all mute during this time, I'd greatly appreciate it. And we'll go ahead and bring Audrey and Abigail in. Hi. Hi, so Hi Audrey and Abigail. You're on with the Sonoma City Council. Okay. Thank you. We're so glad to be here. Our names are Audrey McBride and Abigail Padilla, and we're here to talk about our idea, TextChange. TextChange started with the Brain Baby for our annual science fair project, but we hope to grow it into something more. Our hypothesis. To decrease paper waste in our community and promote education in developing, in developing African countries, our solutions require action from city council. However, to make sure that we are moving towards a more sustainable future for our community. Our first solution, number one, stop allowing schools to throw out their textbooks. Every three years, big educational companies such as Pearson come out with new copies for their textbooks under the guise of them being up to date. However, most textbook information has not changed in the last 20 years. So there's no use for throwing out most of these copies. Our science teacher, Mr. K, informed us that in the last seven years he's been teaching at our school, he's gone through five up-to-date copies of the same book. He says that he feels bad for the waste and wishes he'd recognized the root of the issues earlier. Number two, hosting public book drives in the community that people can come and donate to. Just last week, we hosted a book drive at our school and we're so happy with the number of people supporting our idea. We raised over $315 and 150 books all of which will be going to schools in developing African countries with a nonprofit organization called Books for Africa. Number three, mandating limits on paper consumption in public offices to reduce pulp consumption that ultimately goes straight to the landfill. We can also spread the word in our community through virtual events, local media sources, and informational text pamphlets. The following is why we created TextChange. We found out that 320 million books are thrown out each year. That is 640,000 tons of books. We also found out that only 57% of schools actually recycle their textbooks. Deforestation levels are at an all-time high, which creates more emissions than the, even the transportation sector. This can cause the extinctions of many species that live in the forest and ruins many other animal habitats. The drilling of landfills also upsets the animal habitats that used to live near the landfills. The U.S. paper and pulp consumption is expected to double in the next 30 years, and consequences will only become more dire. Unless people start to take a stand and make a change in their communities, we will be looking towards the future that is not our own and yet completely of our own making. Thank you for your time, and we'd love to discuss this with you farther. Thank you so much, Audrey and Abigail. I appreciate your uh, contribution and your commitment to the environment. Thank you. Like I said, we can't make an action on any of your items tonight just because of the, the Brown Act. So thank you for your engagement. And we'll go ahead and we, I'm seeing nobody else raising their hand, nobody else rising for general public comment. I'll give it a three, two, one. Raise your hand now or forever hold your peace until your item comes up. We'll go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to the council. Do we have any meeting dedications tonight? Seeing none, we'll go ahead and bring it on to item three. Point oh. One. oh, we do have one. I have one, yeah. I would like, hold on, give me 10 seconds to pull it up. Um, I would like to dedicate this meeting to Rebecca Hermosillo's brother. He recently was in hospice and passed away. And um, it's been a terrible year for that family. Um, Rebecca's father just passed away this year as well, or within the last year. Um, and so I'd like to dedicate this meeting tonight to Tony Hermosillo. Me. That's a really tragic situation. Um, moving on, uh, we'll go to uh, presentations. Presentation regarding drought situation in Sonoma County by Sonoma Water. Well, that doesn't look like a drought behind you, but that certainly isn't Lake Sonoma. 
Good evening, uh, council members. My name is Jay Jaspers, uh, chief engineer, director of groundwater management. And you're quite right. That's a picture of uh, Iceland. I got, I forgot what real water looked like. So I had to pull that out of my uh, directory here just to remind right. myself. This first image on your slide deck is a little more ominous. Yes, it is. Um, so um, thank you for inviting us tonight to um, talk uh, about um, the drought that we are in a second year on. And um, as a second year in a drought, it is, uh, you know, the, the stakes and the impacts are increasingly felt. Um, I have a very brief presentation um, and hopefully um, what I want to do is just briefly cover some of the actions that Sonoma Water is um, involved with in terms of responding to this drought, um, as we have done in, in past droughts. And we work closely with our water contractors, including the city, uh, involving a regional and local response to coordinating water conservation, implementing um, innovative um, te new technologies that we've developed with the Corps of Engineers and others in terms of uh, operating our reservoir to save more money for water supply, and also uh, actions we've taken with the State Water Resources Control Board over the last year in terms of reducing in-stream flows to preserve uh, storage in our two reservoirs. So I'll just try to quickly walk through those. Uh, the first thing I just want to mention in terms of uh, droughts as an emergency uh, are a bit different than the wildfires or um, other emergencies like floods. Or emergencies. And the vulnerability and the impacts of droughts really um, depend on your location and your circumstances, whether you have a, uh, a larger aquifer um, or in a more robust aquifer or not, you know, uh, a groundwater depletion area or your surface water supply. Does it come from a, a more robust and larger reservoir like Lake Sonoma uh, or Lake Mendocino, which is much smaller and vulnerable uh, to drought impacts as you'll see. And there are different approaches also um, from a governance and management perspective, and it needs to be at the local level. And so we as a regional agency really work closely, as I said, with the county as well as cities and water districts uh, from uh, our supplies and our responsibilities, but also coordinating down to the city and water district level as it hits the retail uh, user uh, portion of, of drought response. And there's also, of course, rural residential and agriculture water users, primarily right. on groundwater, that maybe are not are not typically involved in a an engineered uh, uh, system such as a city uh, would provide or a water district. So, uh, just very briefly, some of you are, are probably aware of this, uh, but I'll just have this map up here to show the Sonoma water system. We manage the West River. Hey, Jay. Jay, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, this is Colleen Ferguson, um, Pep Works Director, City Engineer. I invited Jay to come speak tonight. Jay, I'm not sure if you know this, but when we look at our screens, the slides are not moving. And I know you've got some cool slides and I wanna make sure everyone can see them. Oh, I'm sorry. Do you see any slides? I do, but it looks like a screen that's not in um, slide presentation mode. It looks like it's working on the slide. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Um, what I'll do is probably, um, can you see, I took it out of slideshow. Can you see me moving the slides now? Yeah. yeah okay. We can well, we'll work with this. I'll just uh, work off of this if that's acceptable. I don't know what happened when it goes to slideshow. So apologize for that. Um, anyway, uh, this is where I was at and um, this is a map of the Russian River system, which Sonoma Water manages uh, with our partner, the Corps of Engineers. And you can see the green area is the Russian River and uh, our two reservoirs we co-manage with the Corps. The larger reservoir is Lake Sonoma, which the city of Sonoma primarily gets its drinking water from. And it's about three times as large as the uh, Lake Mendocino up at the northern part of the Russian River system. Again, we operate that with the Corps of Engineers. Uh, Lake Sonoma is much more robust in terms of providing a water supply because of its size 
and its watershed produces more water. You'll see uh, the orange circle, that's where Sonoma water diverts and treats its water. And we deliver it through a series of pipelines to over 600,000 people in the urban areas of Sonoma and into Marin. And you can see there at the end of one of our aqueducts, Valley of the Moon and City of Sonoma are our two water contractors in the Sonoma Valley. And so um, what I will do is just give you a brief update here of the last two years of where we are with rainfall and storage levels. So you can get, get a picture historically uh, of where we are and how dry these last two years have been. And I'm going to start here with just a graph that shows from 1976 to 2001, uh, the annual rainfall through April 8th um, for a given year. And you can, so this is up near Lake Mendocino up towards the upper part of our system. And you can see the last uh, two years, 2020 and 2021 are, uh, are you know, the second and third driest uh, in terms of rainfall. And you can actually extend that out. We have another plot that shows 127 years of data and 2021 would be the second driest year out of 127 years and 2020 would be the third driest year. Um, corresponding, now if we look at that reservoir, Lake Mendocino, again, which supplies um, Mendocino County and Northern Sonoma County, Cloverdale, Geyserville, Healdsburg, plus agriculture, and provides flow for fish species and recreation. Um, it has, uh, it is really uh, suffering this year due to these two years lack of rainfall. You can see again from 1959 to 2001, the orange is 2021. And the storage on this year, uh, this April 5th of a given year is the lowest it's ever been since the dam was constructed and operated starting in 1959. I mentioned that we have new methodologies for uh, operating a reservoir that we developed with the Corps of Engineers and scientists from NOAA and Scripps with new models and in last year, not 2021, but the first year of the drought, even though it was the third driest in 127 years, we were able to capture water that fell in the early part of the year using this new approach called forecast and form reservoir operations, first in the country to use this. And even though we had the third driest year, we were able to capture an 18% increase over if we had not utilized it. So that. That project there and that operation for that reservoir helped us through a very dry year last year and into the fall. And it was able to provide uh, water users, farmers, and fish uh, more flow through the course of that year. Unfortunately, we've had a second consecutive as dry year. Now I wanna to go to our larger um, reservoir, which is Lake Sonoma. And this one is one that is more directly linked to your water supply because water is released down Dry Creek and then uh, to our uh, diversion facilities and then transmitted to your city. And what you can see is um, the storage levels are about three times as high as Lake Mendocino. So we're okay, but we are the lowest we've ever been um, since uh, you know, uh, 1996 is what this uh, chart shows. So um, we're okay for this year, but if we have another dry year on this reservoir, uh, there will be very um, uh, significant um, uh, issues to resolve. And so we're taking this very seriously in our overall management of water supplies. And then finally, um, I just have one slide on this, but this is a, a huge effort for Sonoma Water as well as I know the city and all of our water contractors that are participating in the Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership. There's a huge outreach program that we've already started and it will be gearing up. And then of course we have our different programs that we do year in and year out to save water, but now we're kicking it into the drought gear, if you will, uh, for additional, um, additional measures related to the drought. And some of those in, are, include conservation. Others include uh, reductions in uh, the lower, we're looking at possibly lowering the flows, in-stream flows in the lower part of the river to match what we've already done. Uh, and also potentially looking at some um, potential reductions as we move forward. We're working with our 
uh, water contractors, including the city, on those discussions as we uh, leave the uh, the wet year, the wet part of the year, the so-called wet part of the year, uh, into our dry season. And so we really are concerned about the upcoming summer and fall. And we are also very mindful that it, we could get a third consecutive dry year. And so we're not just looking in the near term, we certainly are. We're also looking at next year too, and what kind of measures uh, can we put in? Because nobody can predict the weather that far in advance. And so with that, um, I will, um, that concludes my remarks and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, thank and you I'll so just, much. Oh, excuse me, Mayor Harvey. Just wanted to mention that the city's water conservation coordinator, Mike Brett is also on the panel to answer questions that may come up about spe city specific water saving um, tools and information. Great, thank you so much, Colleen. Um, uh, Jay, just want to thank you for your presentation to start out with. Um, I guess the one question I would have is considering that last year was such a dry year as well, um, why did we wait until this year to start conservation efforts? Well, we didn't, we, we conserved last year too. So we have an ongoing process. And actually we also starting last July, we petitioned the state to reduce the flows in the upper part of the river to help conserve some additional water. So um, we did, we did, we conserve all the time and we just kicked it up given the second consecutive year into another year, so to speak. And are we going to see outreach to residents about watering lawns and washing cars and stuff like we did in kind of like the 13, 14 era? Yes. Uh, we're working with, you know, the city and our other contractors for um, a multimedia outreach, social media, print media, radio, et cetera, like we've done in the other droughts. Yes. Councilor Harrington. Uh, when are we going to know the effect on water rates? I assume that water is going to be more expensive. Yeah, so um, what happens is that, um, you know, we have our water rates established for this next year. We've just, we're going through that process now and it's by formula. Um, so we, Sonoma Water, when we sell less, because during a drought we sell less, we have to rely on reserves uh, to make that up because our sales are lower, obviously. Um, so that's how that works. We have a formula through our restructured agreement with our water contractor where rates adhere to that. So um, we have oh, to have a prudent reserve to cover these kinds of contingencies. So for this year, the water rates will remain the same or what the rates are already set and they'll, if they had to be increased, they would be increased next year? Yeah. they're. They've been approved for the water advisory uh, committee, which is a, a you know the electeds for all our water contractors. They still have to go to our board, but that's you know that'll be here shortly, uh, and so that'll be part of the process. So they're essentially established pending our board approval. My question is: In order to increase our local resource, that is the groundwater resource in the Sonoma Valley. Do you have any the plan or if any in the data or in your mind you can share with us? Yes, uh, Council Member Ding, I know you're uh, on the board of the Sonoma Valley Groundwater Sustainability Agency and we have to comply with Sustainable Groundwater Management Act and as part of that, we will have to uh, develop, and we're developing as you know our conversations, our, our plan, which is due to the state in January. Part of that is gonna be um, projects to meet um, the sustainability criteria that we're, we're developing, um, the GSA is developing. And those projects will be uh, projects like conservation, bringing in more recycled water to offset pumping, uh, as well as what we call conjunctive management, which is recharge of rainwater, but also potentially uh, bringing in wintertime Russian river water through our pipelines and uh, putting it down the deeper wells so that you can fill your uh, aquifer up in the wintertime so that during droughts in the dry period, then you can use it. And we've, uh, matter of fact, Sonoma Water and the city of Sonoma 
uh, worked together. We got a grant and we drill, we actually put a well in and tested that, which was very successful program. And so I think we're well set up for that kind of a program moving forward, not only to comply with Sigma, but also to respond to these droughts. Thank you so much. Any questions? Now, another question, do you have any education program available right now during this season? For the uh, drought? Yes. Yes, we do. Uh, it was on my um, slide uh, where we have a whole um, education and drought awareness program. It's, it's in the Sonoma Marin Saving Water Partnership. If you Google that, uh, you can access that information. Uh, and there will be a bunch of uh, drought uh, walk-up awareness events where people can get, you know, buckets or timers and different things like that for water concert, shower heads uh, for water conservation. We did this in the, I think the last two droughts, we did this drought walk up. And again, with our partner, regional partnership as part of that. Thank you again, Jay, thank you. Other questions from other members of council? All right, seeing none. So I guess we'll start to see uh, public outreach around uh, conserving water and reducing water. I see Colleen Ferguson has put in to the chat, uh, savingwaterpartnership.org. You can go to check out that website and learn how to how to conserve water. Um, I'm assuming we're going to put out some social media outreach and maybe a press release in the paper as well from the city. I'm seeing Colleen nod. Good. Right, and I know our um, our water conservation coordinator is communicating with other folks in the Sonoma Water Saving Water Partnership. And as oh, here's Mike on screen now. Um, as, as that rolls, we, we go with it and whatever they're putting out, we um, bring to the city's website and social media and all. And, and it's, it's really helpful that we do it as a unified approach countywide. Everybody's getting the same message. They talk to their neighbor, they're hearing the same thing, no matter who they're getting the water from. And um, that's, that's how we like to do it. Great. And I'd like to thank um, Jay, especially for taking the time to the to the presentation. Jay lives right here in Sonoma, so he understands Sonoma water particularly well, <laughs> and I appreciate him being here. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jay. I appreciate your presentation. Thank Sorry, you, Jay. I'll need to thank be you. concerned about and uh, paying attention to as citizens and uh, shorten your showers and uh, try to try to greenscape your lawn so it's a little more drought tolerant and. Let's conserve as much water as possible, certainly. It looks like we have some people raising hand for public comment, but we weren't intending to do public comment on this one. Uh, considering that people, members of the public would like to speak, do you, is it okay for me to allow that? I think I'm allowed as the mayor, right? So I'll go ahead and allow some public comment here. Um, we'll go ahead and bring in Joanna first. Joanna, go ahead and speak when you're ready. No, I, I did. I was a mistake. Sorry. Okay. Well, you know, conserve water. Thank you. I will. Uh, perhaps uh, Stuart is, is jumping in for actually this item. Can you hear me? We can indeed, Stuart. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Mayor. Um, my question is, and first off, our whole yard has been converted to rock and succulent. So we are doing our part in the thing and it's for fire safety and the whole deal. Fantastic. The question is, um, when does this start to impact our fire safety concerns and water supply? We, we're, um, the uh, city has been doing a lot of high density projects and things are changing pretty dramatically. Uh, specifically back in 2017, uh, my question pertains to like reservoirs at the wineries, Goonlock Boonshu, in my personal estimation, was instrumental in saving the east side here. There were helicopters queued up in, uh, at, at that reservoir the whole time. And the story goes is the dad at Goonlock Boonshu um, would not empty the reservoir because of the fires he went through in the 60s. And all we heard on the east side was helicopters. When there was daylight, there were helicopters sucking water out of that. And are there restrictions coming that could possibly 
impact that kind of a safety device for us? So that's my question. Those are great questions, Stuart. Um, thank you for your public comment. We'll go ahead and bring it back to the floor. I'm seeing nobody else rise. So we'll go ahead and close public comment. Do we have an answer on that one? Obviously, Gunlock Bunchu is not uh, in in within the city of Sonoma's jurisdictions. Our, we really don't have any winey, winery manufacturers or really great growers within our actual jurisdiction. People often don't know where our lines begin and end, but um, we're ending right about what, Fifth Street, uh, Fifth Street East, pretty much a little bit further than that. About six, six, seventh Street is kind of the end of our jurisdiction towards the east side. Um, so, Jay, do you have any comment there? Um, I, I'm assuming that the speaker was uh, referring to potential groundwater. You know, if the ponds were filled with pumping groundwater, might there be some regulations? There's, there's no regulations uh, as such that I'm aware of being contemplated uh, now through the Sigma program. And I'm, I'm sure that the GSA board would kind of take in the public safety uh, aspects of that kind of an operation. Certainly. And I, I'll just comment, we, we've been seeing people pitch development um, that has pools and things like that as part of the fire safety uh, kind of matrix. So I think I think as we we're, we're well aware of that, I doubt that there we'd see major regulations coming at the county level or state level that would block large pools of water near burnable hillsides. So yeah, um, great. Not hearing any additional comments from council. Uh, Jay, really appreciate you coming to comment on this uh, important issue. Uh, water is one of those things that we all need um, and uh, we don't often think about and we're lucky to live in a country where we don't have to think about it. We just open the tap, but we need to think about it now and try to use as little as possible and not waste it. And Colleen, I thank you for your efforts and Mike as well. Uh, as you can tell, Mike conserves water by not shaving and I do the same thing. So it's, uh, it's, a, it's a great thing that we share. So I really appreciate uh, your, your folks' time and uh, let's all try to conserve as much water as possible. Quick showers, let your car be dirty for a while. Thanks guys. Moving on to consent calendar. Um, all items on the consent calendar are considered to be routine and will be acted upon by a single motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless members of the council staff or public request specific items to be removed for separate action. At time of the council may change the order of the agenda. Um, great. So we'll go ahead and uh, do we have any comment on this? I know our city manager wanted to uh, pull one of these items. Okay, I, want to pull, I wanted to pull the one on um, the commission selection. Okay, so that would be item 4.4. And Mayor, I would like to pull 4.5. All right. And uh, Dave, did you want to pull item 4.3? Item 4.3 needs is an item that needs a little bit of direction from you. Okay, beautiful. As so does, we'll does 4.2, correct? Wasn't there a question within 4.2? There was a question about allowing staff to go, I'm forgetting the term, David Storer, but about allowing you to go up to 165,000. I believe the, uh, David here with the city the, uh, planning department, we, uh, the out outsourcing or excuse me, sole sourcing allows us to go directly to a vendor uh, should we not have the a successful arrangement with the de novo that we placed there in the packet. And we would like the ability to go up uh, to the amount uh, I think we put, did we put 160 in there or was it 110? I think 110. Yeah, 110. Our second uh, proposal that we received for, was for 165, but I think if we go north of 110, we, we should come back to the council. Okay. Does that satisfy or Kelsey, do you want to pull it and have discussion about this item? Um, I was under the impression that there was a question within that that well, if a member of the public has a question about it, they can always pull, right? All right. I, I thought that David was asking us to give him authority to sole source that up to 165. Yeah, I'm sorry. I apologize. I think the staff report, we put 110 in there, uh, Council Member Hornet. Okay. Great. So we're going to go ahead and uh, we're going to open this up for public comment. And I see Joanna with her hand raised. Oh, 
for the right item. Joanna, you're on with the Sonoma City Council. I can't, I can't get my low, my hand lowered. <laughs> All right, you know which I'm item so, you wanna, I'm you so wanna sorry. I don't know what's going on, sorry. Which item do you wanna comment on and I'll just make sure to call you for that one. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing? Okay. No. I'm if you look sorry. at the bottom of your screen or click on your name, sometimes that can lower your hand. We got your hand down. Well, thank you, Joanna. Yeah, you got my hand down? Okay. Yeah, you cause... did. You're the most excited member of the class, so that's great. We, we love it. We love bringing you on, so thank you. Uh, so we'll go ahead and, and uh, I'm seeing nobody rise for public comment. I'll go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to the council. I'm looking for a motion, um, accepting if I, and tell me if I'm wrong, uh, or I'll just go ahead and make the motion because I'm already talking. Uh, I'd like to move to approve the consent calendar, accepting items 4.3, 4.4, and 4.5. Second. Mr. Mayor and the seconder, would your motion include approving the staff's recommendation included in that consent calendar? I would ask that it include the staff's recommendation. Yeah, as well as approving the, the consent calendar. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Can we get a roll call vote? Sorry, I have to say that. Council, mem Council member Dean. Aye. Council member Barnett. Aye. Council member Harrington. Aye. Vice Mayor Agramonte. Aye. Mayor Harvey. Aye. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. I like the vote order tonight. It's fun. Um, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll go ahead and move on to item four point three. So, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, this item is your second reading, otherwise known as your adoption of the cannabis ordinance, which, just as a reminder to the public, would allow a second dispensary in Sonoma. And there's a recommendation down at the bottom to ask you to provide direction on staff to whether to hire a consultant to expedite the process. The issue there would be that the fee, we think the fee would cover the cost of that consultant and assist in the expeditiousness of the process. So um, just wanna make sure, I, I as city manager, I'm leaning towards that. I just wanna make sure you were comfortable with that. If you are, uh, that would be part of your motion. If not, we can certainly talk about it. Comments from council? Okay, seeing no questions, we'll go ahead and bring it out. So your your question again, David, is is whether we want to have you hire uh, additional help to make this go expediently. That's correct. Okay, great. Uh, we'll go ahead and go out for public comment. I'm seeing no one with their hand. Oh, here we go. We got Gil. And Joanna, I see your hand, but I don't think it's a real one. So we're gonna. Move on to Gil. Gil, you're on with the Stone City Council. Oh, no, you're not yet. You're still in the Sendy. Mayor Harvey, can you hear me now? I can now. Hey, it's not Gil. No, it's Ken Brown, former mayor. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to the council. Sure. I'd like to give you all a little history lesson just to help put things in perspective. The history of permitting a dispensary in Sonoma actually goes back 20 years. In 2000, the Sonoma County Hemp Bank operated on Napa Street. It eventually closed. Four years later, in 2004, city planner David Goodison determined that a medical dispensary could open on Broadway just south of the plaza. Of course, there were all kinds of political shenanigans behind the scenes and it never came to be. That story is in the Press Democrat archives. That of course is the 2014 attempt by the city council to permit a dispensary which succeeded, but, but then it didn't. <laughs> Many of you know that story, um, I sure know it. To know the history of cannabis in Sonoma is to understand this whole process has been going on not for just the past three and a half years, but for 20 years. Are we tired yet? I am. 
A new national poll found that 69% of Americans now support legalizing cannabis. That's an all-time high, no pun intended. And when you break this survey down, the majority of Democrats and Republicans and independents and people from every age and racial demographic are on board. And we have to know that those numbers are the same in Sonoma, if not even better. Here's some more numbers. There are 30 tasting rooms on or within a stone's throw of the plaza, but it will probably be 18 months for one single dispensary to finally open. This is not making a lot of sense. The permit process is overly burdensome and it's costing the city in revenue. And not only is it costing the city, it's delaying patients access to the wider availability and choice of products that make their lives better, better. I would just like to bring up the spirit of Jewel Matheson, the queen of cannabis in Sedoma. And Jewel was an advocate for medical cannabis, and so am I. Thank you for the opportunity. We appreciate it. Thank you very much, Ken. And next we have Richard Silver. Um, Rebecca, would you just give me a, a two minute and a one minute thing? Because I like to be able to see people when I'm speaking to them as opposed to the three minutes. I'm not going to go much more than a minute and a half. Is that possible, Mayor? <laughs> just can you just make your comment, please, Richard? <laughs> well, I want to I want to look at people. I don't want to look at three zeros, but that's what you want to do. That's what you want. I've got a surprise. That's why. Turn the camera on me. Can you see me? No, we can't see you. Can you start no. the time, Rebecca, please? All right. We're claiming my time. OK, I'm going to be brief. Greetings and salutations, members of the city council and assorted others. Tonight, I will be speaking about your favorite topic and mine, money. And this is chapter four. Uh, I have gone through extensive research reading the HDL reports till it has become a cure for insomnia. And this is what the takeaway is. Every month that there is not a dispensary open in the city of Sonoma, the op lost opportunity cost in hard U.S. dollars is $20,000. So when uh, Ken was mentioning 18 months, that's $360,000 that did not go directly into the city coffers. I am a big advocate of supporting your desire for appropriate and legal revenue. And I strongly urge you to hire a consultant or any other entity so necessary because your application fee should cover your cost to pay said entity. And <clears throat> as Madeline knows well, having $20,000 a month revenue means that I can treat the whole city council to the ice cream social with strawberry ice cream. Um, so I encourage you all to look long and hard and if it takes you another six or eight or 10 months to go through this prof that process, it could be a quarter of a million dollars in opportunity lost to the city. We all need money. Thank you for your time. And I hope you will ponder this seriously over the coming days and weeks. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate it. <laughs> I know you do. I do. It's great. I appreciate that, Mayor. I will go ahead and bring on uh, Josette Bros Eicher. Okay, um, it's Josette Bros Eicher, um, eleven ten Loma Court. Um, hi, City Council members. I really want to thank you for all you have done on creating the cannabis ordinance reviewing sites and applicants, and adding permitting a second dispensary. At this point, I know the major concern is council and staff time for this and all the other priorities the city has. Please do not put this on the back burner. With smart choices like choosing a new and perhaps more efficient and less expensive consultant, 
reaching out without delay to former and new applicants and having an already vetted site, this could be done quickly and not eat up city time needed for other priorities. Another plus is that it will position the city to take advantage of creating jobs, tax revenue, and loyal customers quickly as we recover from the COVID hit to our economy. Last, I will mention that I attended the county BZA meeting for the Glen Ellen dispensary. Here's the bottom line on that one. They approved it, but it will be appealed. In talking with BZA staff, I found out that they will not even address or start the process on the appeal until late fall if, um, as their plate is full. This makes opening this dispensary at least two years away if it opens at all. One funny aside on this one is that several speakers incorrectly stated, why do we need this? As the city of Sonoma will have one up and running by the end of summer and another shortly after. One speaker even stated that David Storer told him this, which I do not believe. It seems when speaking in Sonoma, there is one coming tomorrow in the, in the valley. When speaking in the valley, there is one coming in the city of Sonoma tomorrow. An interesting Wonder phenomenon. On the Fremont site, the application, applicant has not even submitted a viable or defined plan. Also, this applicant has so many personal and professional issues, I doubt this will ever get off the ground. Just more reasons to position the city to be in the right place at the right time by moving quickly on a second dispensary. Thank you so much for listening to me once again. Thank you, Josette. And I'm seeing Gil raise his hand and he made a comment, but it was Ken masquerading as Gil. And I'm guessing that this is gonna be Gil, but if it's Ken, you only get one shot. So we'll go ahead and bring Gil in. I assure you it is I, Gil Latimer. At, uh, <laughs> that's going crazy, man. It was all over the place. Go ahead and unmute yourself, please, Gil. Oh, there you go. I Thanks. assure it's me. Gil Latimer, Sonoma, uh, Grant Court, and uh, representing Sonoma Valley Cannabis Group, of course. So thank you, Mr. Mayor, Madam Vice Mayor, Council members Amy Harrington, Jack Ding, and Kelso Barnett, as well as Planning Director David Storr and City Manager David Kiff and their entire staff for getting us to where we now find ourselves on the cusp of affording the citizens of this city and the Valley safe legal access to safe uh, legal cannabis. Some extra appreciation as well to David Storr and David Kiff for looking for ways to streamline the process. We, know, we all know this hasn't been the smoothest of roads. Uh, we do have some questions, however, and uh, regarding the shortened timeline offered, is that with or without the assistance of a consultant? Also, staff suggests it will take 90 days to draw up new administrative regulations and application procedures and guidelines and return to the council for their adoption. This before the new RFP is issued. So that 90 days is exclusive of the 26 week timeline, yes? If that's the case, then we're looking at a total of 38 weeks plus five more months for the land use and building permit process and the final confirmation. New, is, One the minute. Best, is the best case scenario for the opening of the second dispensary 14 and a half months, late summer of next year wow perhaps spark is the worst case scenario but it will probably wind up being 18 to 19 months before it opens about hiring a consultant hdl's reputation is not pristine a number of jurisdictions have had issues with them most recently, it had to give the city of Fairfield its money back over scoring irregularities. We would recommend at least taking a look at two other municipal consultants, Avenue Insights and SCI Consulting Group. Both have experience working with local jurisdictions on cannabis. They 
also be contract planners who are familiar with cannabis. Look, it's been a long and sometimes arduous road, but you stuck to it and here we are. We don't have to kick that can anymore. Like many of you, I'm turning this last page, be as expeditious as possible and close this chapter of the Sonoma dispensary saga Amen. once and for all. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Go. Appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. And we've got Christopher Bloom up next. Hi, good evening, Mayor, Vice Mayor, and City Staff. Um, my name is Christopher Bloom. Um, I am with uh, Element 7. We were one of the applicants last time that uh, uh, ended up just outside the top five. Um, so I've been paying close attention to this. Obviously, um, uh, you know, we, we feel like we really missed an opportunity and we've grown quite a bit since the last uh, RFP process and, and we'd really like to be a part of this one. I know that uh, last time, um, our last meeting that, that you folks were discussing this, you know, one of the topics of conversation is, you know, who is going to be allowed in this RFP, whether it was just going to be allowed, you know, the top five, only the people that applied last time or opened it up to general public. Um, that's something I'd, I'd be very interested in getting um, clarified. Um, and then my other question um, uh, or actually comment um, was I noticed in this new round, one of the things you changed in order to streamline it uh, was require a site from the very beginning. Um, I would recommend against this. I think that, you know, most other jurisdictions do that. They require a site from the beginning. I think that's something that uh, the city of Sonoma did absolutely correctly by not requiring that and, and uh, choosing the best applicants and then having those applicants go in and get sites. All too often what happens is that, um, you know, the, the, the best applicant may not be able to secure the best site, but because that application was tied to that site, they're stuck with it. Um, when Sonoma decided to choose the best applicants and then have them choose the site, you got to weed out some of the others that, you know, maybe you didn't want there. Unfortunately, we fell on just on that side of it. I think we were number six. Um, uh, but I thought that was a really good process, especially with the, the real estate market as it is now um, and the process as drawn out as it is, um, it's a huge waste of money. And if people, if, if other businesses have or want the opportunity to move into these spaces and, and open up shop quickly because the regulations don't stand in their way quite like they do with cannabis, they should by all means have that opportunity um, because that tax revenue is going to get to the city quicker. Um, it, it, you know, it may take a little bit more with the process to, you know, judge and then have them pick out the site and then have them do the review process. But in my opinion, that was something that, you know, Sonoma really stood out and, and uh, uh, excelled. And I, I think it, it should be uh, noted, I, I've commented this for many other cities that, uh, um, that they should have taken your lead and, and required a site at a different time. So with that, I thank you for your time. And I look forward to hearing um, your answer. Thank you, Christopher Bloom. Seeing no one else raising. Oh, we do have Siobhan Brady. Good evening. Can you folks hear me? Yes, we can. Wonderful. Thank you for taking my comment. Um, I echo Ken Brown's sentiment. I know this has been a long process for all of you. Um, I'd like to say that Justice Grown is very interested in participating um, in this process. And as you folks know, we were the, the runner up in the first round. And I might suggest that we could save quite a bit of staff time should we be considered um, in this, this second go around. Um, we've been pretty committed to the city of Sonoma, have long standing in the town. And um, I also have some concern about HDL scoring the process overall. I think that there's been a number of issues throughout the state with HDL, and I would encourage staff to look at other uh, vendors for such work. Um, I wanna thank all of you for your time and energy and diligence and making sure that an operator of high integrity is selected to serve the people of Sonoma. Thank you for your time.
Hey, Siobhan. Thank you very much. Okay, I'm seeing nobody else rise for public comment. We'll go ahead and bring it back to the council. And we heard a couple of questions in there. So if we can get some answers to those. I appreciate it. Yeah, Mr. Mayor David here. I'll try to respond. And if I forget some of the questions, please remind me. The intent in the staff report was to kind of show where we think po uh, possible uh, changes could be made to shorten the timeline. And clearly the most significant one was uh, taking that 45 days that we had to uh, select the site and place that into the beginning. Otherwise, we could actually change that seven weeks, I think, at the very first part of the application for the RFP that could be trimmed, recognizing that there's time there needed to select a site that would then uh, be a good time of seven weeks to keep there if that piece was in there. If it's removed, it needs to be added back in there somewhere else anyway. So it's really a matter of uh, the council and, and your direction as to where that could go. The, again, the second intent of the, the report was to show that these are possible changes and the intent is there to try to streamline, uh, but we'll get a better idea of what we can and cannot do once we get a consultant on board. And again, certainly heard the message about uh, your uh, HDL that we've heard from the public and also from the council at the last meeting. But uh, I think as far as the first 90 day task that could be done at a staff level, and that would be creating a, a streamlined process to come back uh, to you within 90 days. And I, that's something I would work with uh, our city attorney on. Did that help uh, answer some of those questions? Yeah, that's great. And then is, is there a status update on where Spark is in the process? They're, they, they've applied now for a permit? Sure. Uh, they, are, they were planning on going to the last commission meeting in April. They're going to the meeting in April, excuse me, in May. Uh, we're working on a, uh, uh, some data information that we need to support uh, an infill uh, exemption through, through a categorical exemption through CEQA. We hope to have that information uh, by the 25th of this month. Great. Thank you. No further questions from me. Any other questions from Go ahead. Kelsey? I have a question. So I assume uh, once staff uh, selects a consultant for this process, this is going to come back to council similar to our housing element consultant and we will be able to weigh in and approve who the consultant is is that correct that, that's my understanding i don't know why it would be any different uh Odex. i think the city manager has an author, authorization up to a certain amount but given the uh the issue here i think it'd be smart regardless of the fee the contract amount that it comes to the council and then once that consultant is selected and they look at the process is that will there be an opportunity for council to weigh in on the process for example i had some issues with the last process and so as we move forward um if we look if we're going to try to create opportunities for local sonoma valley entrepreneurs uh, that may have been locked out of the earlier process is that we're still going to have that opportunity i believe so yeah i think that's the intent okay thank you in fact if i can just add to that the uh, we will be creating uh, administrative guidelines and procedures and application processes that the council will adopt as they did with the first process. They did that first on December 16th of uh, 2019, if I recall. Okay, thank you. So I'm trying to eat a little bit of dinner. Um, any other uh, comments from any member of council? Okay, great, we've had public comment. Um, so do we have a motion on this item? <clears throat> motion to approve. Is that good enough, Jeff? Go for a second from Jack Dane. Great. We get a roll call vote, please. Council member Dean. Aye. Council member Barnett. Aye. Councilmember Harrington? Aye. Vice Mayor Agramonte? I'm mute. Madeline, you're muted. Or, I'm sorry, Vice Mayor Agramonte, you're muted. <laughs> I've been muted with. Uh oh, she keeps music me. What was your, I'm sorry, what was your response, Vice no. Mayor Agramonte? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Harvey? Uh, yes. 
Thank you. The motion carries four one. Great. Move on to item um, four point four: adopt a resolution uh, making changes to the Alpha Commission and committee appointments policy. We're going to turn this over to uh, Dave Kip. So, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, this was uh, Rebecca and my attempt to um, put in some type of, of verbiage uh, what you, as well as through, I think, primarily Council Member Harrington's motion reflected. So, I'd maybe, add, um, th again, this was about what happens in the event that a, a Council Member is reelected or that a Council Member is appointed and not elected, and um, I'm, I'm happy to take any of Council Member Harrington or the, or the other group, the other Council Members' comments on that, as is Rebecca. You want me to put that on the screen, Council Member Harrington, or? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, let me see if I can find it. Go ahead, Council Member Harrington. I guess before we get to public comment on this item, I just read the <laughs> second part and I, I don't know that it helps um, clarify things, so I, Maybe the way I read it is what you're saying is if you are appointed, you cannot pick the uh, commissioners, but if you, if a special election were held, then you would pick them. Is that what it's supposed to say? Yes. I, I, I recall talk, Council Member Barnett talking about this at the meeting and saying that he could understand um, make not make not replacing someone who was um in a sorry when the council member was in an, an appointed role but that if a special election occurred then that special elect that person elected at the special election would get a chance to make his or her appointments so i guess i would just add in item two in uh, sentence uh i think it's the third one um just add the word following the seating of a newly elected, even though it says elected in the, if a council member leaves office before their term concludes, the departing council members appointee can remain on the group B commission until such time as the appointee is reappointed or replaced by the council member newly elected to the departing council member seat. It's a little, it's a little awkward. Yeah. Yeah. How about just right? If a council member leaves office before their term concludes, the departing council member's appointee can be, remain on the group B commission. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I know it's a little confusing. I know Re Rebecca and I went back and forth on this, and the second sentence, I thought, it leaves by omission the thought that um, this does not happen when a special election has occurred. It only happens, so, sorry, the, the appointment only ha the new appointment, the replacement only happens when a person is elected to the seat. Maybe we could just make three things and it would say, Two would be if a council member leaves office before their term com concludes and a and are replaced by um I don't know what the technical term is, but a vote of the council, then they'll stay on until the next election. And then three would say if a council member leaves and before their term concludes and are replaced with um are replaced as a result of a special election, then blah blah blah. That would be more clear. I understand what you're saying. <laughs> so, uh, oh, sorry. May I, I just, I just also wanted to offer one more hypothetical scenario we might want to put in here. What happens if a appointed um, commissioner uh, resigns or, you know, dies? Does the new appointed council member get to select that therefore that do you understand what i'm saying if the person leaves then whoever's sitting in that seat uh fills the vacancy right should that be isn't that just obvious or should that be written out i feel that that is obvious myself yes so, obviously. 
Yeah, but with these new rules, it may become less obvious because we have these steps now. We have like a spelled out process. So it's simple enough to add a fourth and just write it in, right? So just say, if a, if a commissioner, uh, if an appointed commissioner resigns or otherwise leaves office before fires, and they've been appointed by a council member who, their seat was appointed by a council member who is no longer serving on the Sonoma City Council, the uh, replacement council member can will make the appointment. Right. Well, now that I'm thoroughly confused. Um, <laughs> now, what happens if they're just like they're in like a middle seat where uh, they're abducted and they're somewhere else, but there's a high percentage chance of return for the planning commissioner? Then do we appoint? Or, what if our what if a commissioner becomes a conservatee and they lose legal capacity to contract? Right. <laughs> it could be a big list. Oh, no. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of issues that are, you know, being avoided <laughs> here. <laughs> All right. What well, what well, before we go forward, would you like this brought back in two weeks or or would you rather us wordsmith it and bring it back based on what you said? I'd rather you just wordsmith it myself. Okay, you don't want to see this again. <laughs> I right. don't. I don't need Rebecca, to. Rebecca, do you feel like uh, you have you and I have I know you have a good understanding of it? And we can. Suss yeah, it out. that makes sense to me. Great. I'll, I'll try to help too if you'd like me to help. Thanks. <laughs> Layman's <laughs> terms, please. Layman's terms. No, no, no. No legalese only. Gosh. It's much more precise. Where to for and whereas and yeah. Contra uh, preferendum. Let's throw it in there. All right, great. I uh, have seven Latin terms I'm going to toss into this rule. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll go ahead and open it up for public comment. Seeing no one rise, we'll go ahead and bring it right back to the council. And I'm looking for a motion. I don't think we need comment on this, huh? I would put it on for my Boom. Jack with the motion. Do we have a second? Second. Seconded by Kelso Barnett. We'll go ahead and go for a roll call vote, please. So remember, me, could I say something? I can barely hear you. It's all garbled. So I don't know what was just said. Uh, so we had uh, Jack Ding make a motion. Kelso Barnett seconded <laughs> that motion. And now we're looking for a roll call vote. To do what? To approve this. Well, basically what's going to happen is Dave and Rebecca are going to go ahead and rewrite this language to include kind of what we said, and we're approving it, assuming that they're going to do a good job. Okay, okay, that's fine. I okay. still don't okay. hear it, but that's okay. I get it. Is there an issue with the audio? There may be, if, I guess we got to, somebody's giving a lot of reverb, and so we got to try to, we got to try to mute microphones as much as possible tonight. Every mind, I'm all muted without my control. <laughs> all right, good. If we can get a roll call vote, please, Rebecca. Let's start at the top. Council Member Ding. Aye. Council Member Barnett. Aye. Council Member Harrington. Aye. Vice Mayor Agramonti. Aye. Mayor Harvey. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. <clears throat> Mayor Harvey, yes, we, we actually do need to go back to four point two just to complete oh, that's the right. trifecta of repeats on this. Okay, yeah, uh, let's just do that now then. Okay, I think we have to do four point five too. It's pretty, it's pretty simple on four point two, and I'll share my screen here. And Uh, Dave, do you want me to just do a quick outline for what we're doing? Uh, I think I got it. Uh, okay. I'm going to share my screen. We're basically in the second resolved of the resolution. We're changing the number from 110,000 to 165, and I'll show that to you here. So, so right here where my cursor is, the 110, the second 
item of the 110 is mentioned would go to 165 and that that's all we needed changed Happy yeah, to at the top two, the title needs to uh, change too, David. Uh, thank you, Mr. City Attorney. Yes, indeed, right up here. Amount not to exceed 165. Yeah, I want to thank uh, Council Member Barnett for pointing that out. I had made an error by not putting the 165 limit in the resolution, but it was in the staff report. So thank you. Can you, uh, Dave? Uh, uh, listen, wait. Uh, um, you know, the uh, the agenda item says one ten. We're stuck with that. You can't you can't go above that. Yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. So we'll bring it back. Yeah. Okay. We'll bring it back. So we'll move on to item four point five. Yeah. All right. Um, Consideration, discussion, possible action to accept the city of Sonoma housing element 2020. I'll go ahead and turn it over to David Storer. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. We've already uh, submitted the, the data to HCD. We wanted to kind of present that to the council. The good news here is you see the staff report that you've already made our arena for the fifth cycle. We have two years left. We're at 170 units. I think the diagram in the staff report represents that. So. Uh, we're well on our way to making all of our uh, arena numbers in all of the categories. We're at par in the VLI, but uh, these can be attributed to the Saha project, Altamira, Alter something else right now, uh, and then also the Mockingbird Lane project. Those are the ones that kind of took us over the hill, so over the limits. So thank you to everybody for the support in providing uh, housing for all income levels in the city of Sonoma. That concludes Great. my comments, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Questions, thoughts from council? Yeah, I mean, I pulled it just because we're about to embark on our next housing element. And I just think that uh, the public should sort of know what was in this report and how we've been making tremendous progress on the fifth cycle. And we um, should be proud of that. And I just wanted to compliment planning staff for putting together this report. And um, I just wanted it to be pulled. Obviously, it's timely considering we're, we're embarking upon the, the housing element. So. Great. And just for in layman's terms, what rein allocation numbers? If everybody could mute, please, because I'm getting the, uh, the reverb. I think it's like it's coming from you, Mallory. Um, if they're just in layman's terms, RENA, RENA numbers are regional housing needs assessment numbers that come from the state. Uh, how many housing units we need to build according to the state. Um, and these are at low income levels, middle income levels, and at market rate levels as well. The city has met all of these requirements uh, over the last cycle, I believe it's a 10 year cycle. Um, and so, uh, yeah, that's a uh, great news. There's uh, the new affordable housing project on Broadway it looks beautiful and it looks like it should be opening up fairly soon. Um, and uh, yeah, our, our next arena cycle is significantly larger than this one's about uh, two, about two times. So um, it's gonna be a little more pressure to get more housing done, but uh, we, will, we will meet it as we will meet the challenge as we do. Uh, so great. I'll uh, go ahead and open it up for public comment. I'm seeing Fred Albach raising his hand. We'll bring Fred right in here. Thank you, okay. Mayor Harvey. I just had a couple questions for um, Planning Director Store. I was curious what would happen with any uh, units that were produced in Fifth Cycle Arena before six cycle arena starts, will those try to be applied to the six cycle arena? And if so, would past arena deficits be applied to to the six cycle arena as well? That's it. Thank you. Great technical question from Fred Albach. Do we have anybody else raising their hand? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and turn that question over to David Storer. Yes, uh, Mr. Wright, thank you. Great question. At present, there is no provision uh, that I'm aware of where past deficits or future credits can be mucked around with. I do know that there's a, an interest uh, at uh, HCD in entertaining the thought for uh, passovers through to the next cycle. Uh, I believe that legislation will be created this year. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, certainly aware that there's a, an interest in doing so. But certainly, I've never seen anything going backwards. Thank you so much, David. And I'll affirmatively close uh, public comment as well. I see Jeff getting nervous, so make sure public comment is closed. 
And we'll go on. Uh, do we have a motion on this one? For comments? Yeah, something's going on with Madeline's computer. Um, Madeline, maybe try signing out of the Zoom and jumping back in. Well, I'm being unmuted, so I can't do anything. I'll call her. I'm not making any changes to her. Yeah, I sound. agree. <laughs> Can we get a motion though? Move to approve. Yep. I second. Hello? Hey, Madeline. Logan? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Try, try, try uh, quitting Zoom, like leaving Zoom and coming back in. You're reverbing pretty fast. Okay, because I just got muted and unmuted and I haven't touched anything. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Rebecca's not doing it either. I know. I know. I know. I know. I don't know. I'm watching it go back and forth, but I'm not doing it. <laughs> All right, great. Mine has a lot of echo also. Yeah, it's coming from Madeline's computer. Uh, what, what are we on the roll call vote? Is it my turn? We haven't started it yet. Okay, should we if wait for Madeline to leave and come back? It's up to you. It's not here, okay. All right, we got four, we can do it. Let's do the vote. Okay, Council Member Ding. Okay. Now Jack is. Council Member Aye. Ding is mute. Aye. Aye. Council Member Barnett. Aye. Council Member Harrington. Aye. Aye. Vice Mayor Agramonte. Maybe. Mayor Harvey. I don't even know. Sorry. All right. Is that an aye? Yeah. Mayor Harvey. Aye for me. Thank you, the motion carries back. Can I suggest that we take a five minute break and maybe Madeline can log out and log back in and we can try and uh, improve this because the uh, feedback is um, hard to bad. take. Yeah. Smart move, Council Member Harrington. We will take a five minute recess and try to figure out uh, Madeline's technical difficulties here.
artwork have additional insurance? So, uh, per, our council member, Dean, we have a um, pretty comprehensive um, agreement between the museum and the city of Sonoma and all of those items, um, the identification of the art um, responsibilities are all outlined in that in that document. I'd be well, I, I would definitely share it with you. Thank you. Okay. So uh, the two pieces that you should be seeing on your screen are the two um, pieces that are being uh, proposed for the front lawn near the um, the green bell um, on either side of the green bell. So the first one's called Entitled, it's by Jun, uh, Jun Kaneko, and the second one is Untitled by Kaneko. Um, so those are the, the two pieces, um, and they're just giving you different perspectives of the same piece. And they're like eight feet tall, right? Oh boy, hold on a second, Logan. Uh, There's a hundred inches. They're good size. They are a uh, hundred inches tall. They weigh around, roughly about 1,500 pounds and 1,600 pounds. That's huge. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool. So the second um, artist that will be on display or be on display is our artist, uh, Catherine Daly. And this is her Aurora, the third. Okay. And this is a really unique piece. Um, I'm actually really excited to see it. It's a reflection, a uh, reflective piece. And I'm sure Linda, uh, Ms. Keaton can speak um, in more details about this piece. You want to have Linda come on and talk about the pieces? That would be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> not that you're not doing a great job, Lisa, but she's the president of the museum. She's like the head of the museum. So let's have her jump in. Exactly. Exactly. Get the experts on the line. Ah, beautiful. It is so beautiful. Thank you, Lisa. Linda, you can go ahead and talk now. These, um, thank you. Um, these two pieces are by artist Bruce Beasley and they're granite pieces. Um, he's shown them in a, in a number of, of places and these are uh, two that we're proposing for our installation as well. And I think there should be one more uh, group of three. Yeah, and, and this is uh, three pieces by Peter Hassan. The lower one that is illuminated um, is a very large piece. It's about eight feet tall as well. And then the other two are, are smaller, uh, Metcat smaller, a little bit smaller scale pieces, but on, on high pedestals. So they're appropriate sizes for um, public art. And Lisa, Linda, do you want me to go to there? <clears throat> so Linda, are these the only two that the uh... The Untitled by uh, June Kaneko are the only two that you want, you're asking, requesting to put at the, the plaza lawn? Those are the two that I'm asking to put on the uh, plaza front lawn, yes. Okay. What would these be on? They'd be on like a metal plate or they would be on a stand or how would they be displayed? They're on five by eight um, metal plates and the pieces are welded to the plates. And they're put in place, and and then um, uh, wood chips, red wood chips, are put over that plate to mitigate any any tripping hazard. So you don't see the metal plate. Yeah. So it's not going to be displayed this way. Yes, there the the table that it's on will be. It, that's what will be um, welded to the metal plate. Oh. Uh, Thank you. You're welcome. Oh, the table will be on metal plate. Yes, a, yes. Yeah, I was like, how are you going to weld ceramic? I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, so when we were talking about, I believe someone said this was 100 inches tall. Does that include the table? Yes. OK, thank you. Why, can I ask another question? Yeah. Why 
why is it important to have these in front of City Hall? And um, I know previously we had our Arts Commission, which I would really want ultimately them to be involved because I think this is a great project for them. Um, talking about placement of um, works in our public spaces. So what is it about these that, why do they have to be on the front lawn? Or do they? God, excuse me. These two pieces, I, I selected these two pieces for the front lawn because of their, for, for actually for a number of reasons. They, they fit into the theme of the exhibition, a delicate balance, and um, because of their size, their scale, um, the stature, statue, stature, excuse me, of the artist, um, because they would be cited because of the aesthetics of citing them um, uh, in that front lawn. Um, and also because it's a strong statement of, um, of support of the arts and culture. And um, my feeling is that it's by placing the art of also an, an Asian American artist that it indeed is, is also a strong show of support for the Asian American and Pacific Islander community at a time when it's sorely needed. It's a very prominent position. Um, it's very visible. And those are the reasons why I've selected these two pieces for that front lawn. And do you think that if it could not be on the front lawn, you would not want to have it somewhere else? Um, I could, there is a, one other sighting that I think would, would work for these pieces, yes. But I think the best sighting is to have them at the front of the plaza lawn. And what is the second best sighting? Probably um, right now I have the two pieces from Bruce Beasley cited um, across from Maya restaurant on that corner there on either side of the, um, the sidewalk. And I would probably switch those to another location and put these two heads there if there was a, a reason to move them over in that area. Kind of the start of that little promenade with the trees yes. there. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank We've you. We've cited public art there. Uh, previously. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to, I, I kind of, I'm hearing some of the concerns from Colleen. It, can we stop sharing screens so we can see each other too? Um, is it possible to shift the location of these back from the very, very front of that front lawn a little bit? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Because if they were back a little bit, they might be less visible for cars driving by. Also, people, what they want to do is capture a picture of the statue, the, the art with the city hall behind it, right? And so if it's back shifted far enough, they could probably get that photo without being halfway into the street. They could. Yeah, they would work um, being set back a little bit. Okay. Other questions? How long would they be there? They're scheduled to be installed, all the, the public art is scheduled to be installed on May 4th and be installed on October 19th. On May 4th and be, okay. You should start a, a month after and they could be in June. Um, any other questions or comments from the council? No, they're beautiful. Hi. Uh, my question is, do you have the descrip uh, description or plague introduce this marvelous artist because he is so famous, but some people maybe uh, don't, don't know uh, his background. Knuckle or any, you know, the, who Ooh. is the artist, what is the major and the art he has. Yeah, he is. Um, he was born in Japan and moved to California to attend school. He attended um, Chouinard Art School, which is now Cal Arts. Uh, he also attended UC Berkeley. Um, he taught at Scripps um, and spent about 14 years um, as a student studying art in, in California. Um, he is uh, world renowned. He works in a number of media right now. He's living in um, Omaha. And so these pieces 
are scheduled to be shipped out from Omaha, but he, you're, you're right, Council Member Dean, he is a, a world-renowned artist, and we're very fortunate to that these pieces became available. Will there be a placard kind of describing things about yeah, you? Yeah, we, we have signage for each of the um, pieces, and um, the signage says, please do not touch. And it also um, uh, lets people know that this is a partnership between the city and SVMA, and we'll have a little description. There's a, there's a little bit of verbiage at, at each of those signs, and they're, they're very low. They're the same signs we've used in, in previous exhibitions. I'll ask on the pre please do not touch our, our city manager was asking if kids climb on these I remember the deer statues that came in and there's some great video of kids climbing all over them and doing cartwheels off of them and the rest of it. So is there a, is there some preventative measure from people because I, I, I mean, somebody is going to get on top of one of these things. I, I, yeah, they, they, people interact with public art in very intimate, personal ways and in ways that they would never think of interacting with art in, in a museum. And that's one of the reasons why I love public art. It's, it's immediate. Um, kids, especially, I love to watch them um, when they're around these pieces. Um, they, yeah, they, 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 one of the reasons why the, the plates are put on there to stabilize the pieces to ensure that if somebody climbs on them, on them they're not going to tip over. Um, the artists know that um, Sonomans like to touch and um, climb on and, and interact with art, and um, they're all aware of that. And these pieces are, are um, they're as safe as they can be for people to climb on. Sure. Go ahead, Councilmember Burnett. Yes, um, thank you, Linda. Um, this has been a very interesting presentation thus far, and I think we're so lucky. I love our public art program. I love the temporary nature of it. I think we're so lucky for a town of our size to have a resource like the Museum of Art and just this public art program. So thank you. Um, I guess I would, my one question to you, and, and perhaps your board has discussed this, was there any concern that, I mean, we've had art in the horseshoe right there before, but recently, but um, you know, with Sonoma Wood Film Festival, love which was connected to the fires and then the hearts which was connected to the pandemic i don't think we've really had art in the horseshoe before it was just art for art's sake and was there any concern that the placement of this might you know knowing sonoma the way we all do this will get a lot of people talking it could be controversial and was there any concern that this might push back future public art programs because future councils might not want to deal with the controversy that could come from placing it there. And it's just an open question for you and the council. Would you like me to respond to that? I, I mean, is there any concern? You know, I know in other communities like in Petaluma, they just put these like, I wanna say bathtubs. I mean, there was a big, you know, year long controversy about bathtubs like in the air and, you know, pushback from the community and public art often can create a conversation, which I think is the point. But is there any concern that the placement sort of, in my view, we haven't had a precedent like this, like art, just for art's sake right there, not connected to some sort of community thing, could create a situation in our community where people might be reluctant to do this in the future because this is so controversial. And maybe it won't be, I don't know. But I, I do think these heads may get a lot of people talking if they're right there. I city. think people kind of like it. It's like with the Albert Paley, there was a lot of people who liked it, and a lot of people who didn't like it, but even the ones who didn't like it wanted to take their friends by them to show them how bad it was in their opinion. So I think it's kind of fun. It was like, hey, let's take a trip down to see this art I don't like, or I do like. I don't know. I think uh I think it's very healthy and uh it's kind of good if it engenders some emotion. Uh, I don't know. I think that's part of the fun of it. So. I agree. And I think, you know, given the temporary nature of these, it's it's different than the bathtub, which is going to be in Petaluma forever until somebody runs for council on the get rid of the bathtub uh, agenda. So I think it's uh, I think it's it's great that it's kind of temporary. I think it's great when it creates conversation. And I think like pieces like this are really kind of what keeps Sonoma ahead of the curve on uh, on, you know, visitors and, and um, you know, supporting public art. So. Yeah, and like, um, you know, I went to UC Davis and that whole campus was, I don't know if they still have them, but it was all, they had these egg heads everywhere. There was heads that was like a, you know, big thing on campus, it was fun. So, 
Great. I, I don't know, Linda, I, I answered for you, but if you have a different answer, <laughs> feel free to give it, sorry. Yeah, if, if you'd like me to respond, I guarantee that there will be people that, that don't like this. Um, and, and as there were with every other public art exhibition that, that we've done, um, my experience is, as Amy said, that you know, a lot of people, when, when the first partnership that, that the museum did with the city brought Albert Paley um, nine monumental works, some were 12, 15 feet tall. They were very contemporary looking and there were lots of people that were not in favor of that. But it's interesting as the months went by and um, people started walking past, um, even some of the folks that I talked to that initially didn't think it was a good idea ended up really liking those pieces. And I know there was a movement to even buy um, one or two of those pieces, um, especially the one in Depot Park that, that um, people were walking past uh, there on the, on the bike path. Um, so I think having controversy, having some pushback is, is the nature of public art. And, and yes, there will be some people that, that um, voice their opinion. The good thing about this partnership between the museum and the city is that if you don't like it, it goes away in five and a half months. Great. All right, um, we got to go and head go out to public comment. Oh, the Albert Paley ones were those super angular ones. Yes. Uh, yeah, I couldn't stand those. <laughs> the, the one on the bike path kind of looked like a, like a seaweed kind of a seaweed. Yeah. yeah. I had lots of chats about those. I was glad when they left. But it's kind of cool to have it like there and then have they go. I, I love it. I think it's great. All right, great. Uh, we'll go ahead and bring in, do we have public comment? On this, we've got a few. So we've got Sonoma Community Center <clears throat> coming in first. Sonoma Community Center, you are on with the Sonoma City Council. Two institutions. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Okay, great. Uh, hello, council members, city staff, and the amazing community members who are in attendance tonight. I'm Kayla Stein, the Director of Ceramics and Arts at Sonoma Community Center. In April of 2020, I developed and co-chaired the Heart of Sonoma project that took place and brought hearts to the plaza, the springs, and local businesses. And I thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight in support of June Kaneko's work, front and center of the plaza. I appreciate the council's previous remarks and questions regarding this work and location. As you may have heard, the ceramics program at Sonoma Community Center has national recognition and has grown to reach international audiences. Ceramics is integral to the identity of the Sonoma Community Center. June Kaneko is an icon in the ceramic and art community worldwide. As a BFA and MFA student, we learned about Kaneko as a significant figure in the modern art history and American ceramics scene. To have his work prominently displayed on our plaza would be significant that we as a community value the arts. Kaneko's work emerges from his Japanese American heritage and showcasing this work prominently would show Sonoma's support for diversity in the arts, the arts community at large, and the worth of designating prominent space for public art. The head as a sculptural form in monumental scale is timely because anyone and everyone can personally identify with a non-gendered abstract head. This work has the gravity to represent at once the individual and humanity as a whole. The playful sensibility of these forms ensure that all ages can enjoy them, much like Lisa Reinertson's life-size bronze animals that SVMA successfully brought to the plaza in 2018. The juxtaposition of a historic site to host contemporary work makes strong impression. It shows that a community who values history and legacy while keeping public spaces relevant, dynamic, and engaging. Utilizing spaces in this way facilitates and supports community building while creating new histories and traditions for Sonoma. And for multiple years now, the Sonoma Plaza has hosted public art facilitated by SVMA. And the way I look at it, this is the beginning of a new tradition. This history, this is history in the making. Audrey, uh, 30 seconds left. Do you remember the Love Sculpture by Laura Kimpton? 
This art installation marked the anniversary of the fires. Well, what I see June Kaneko's work doing is marking our emergence after COVID-19 to bring community together. So it's not arts for art's sake. It's marking the end of a pandemic. Thank you. Thank very you. Much. We'll go on to Pat uh, Mir Johnson. Apologize if I can't get your name right. Okay, I'm Pat Meyer Johnson. I am a uh, local working artist here in Sonoma. And I'm also on the board of directors of the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art. Um, we love Sonoma and we believe that this is one of the best places on earth and we love art and feel that public art is a necessary part of our community's personality and image. And while we love Sonoma's food and wine and history and who doesn't, we need to give visitors even more of a reason to come to our town while at the same time satisfying the cultural needs and de desires of our own citizens. And one way to do that is through free, courageous, and confident public art that is boldly on display and greets people as one of the first things they see when they come to our plaza. I mean, what does art say to us and the rest of the world about ourselves, that we care enough to invest in showcasing large works that are freely and easily accessible for our community to view. That there is support within our community for art. That people of all ages and all walks of life can have something to notice, enjoy, challenge, and simply to think about. And visitors will return home to talk about it. And that we care how we project ourselves as a community beyond the everyday. So by having public art regularly and prominently on display at the plaza says that we believe creativity counts and we want to proudly share art generated both outside as well as art created within our own town. Art creates conversation, controversy and gives so much more dimension to our town. Let's boldly display it for all to see. Thank you very much. Uh, moving on to Connie uh, Shellen. Give her my best shot. Apologize, Connie. Can you hear me okay? We can indeed. Wonderful. Hello, City, uh, City Council, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Connie Schleyline, uh, and I am a Sonoma resident. I moved to Sonoma six years ago. I moved from Colorado, Loveland, Colorado, to be precise, one of the top art cities in the United States. And also from, I, I also lived in Vail, which also has a huge public art program. My 30 year career in the city of Loveland was it as an art educator and a university art education professor. Uh, currently, I'm on the Cultural and Fine Arts Commission, the Sonoma Valley Museum uh, Board, and I was also co-chair of the Heart of Sonoma uh, installation this last summer in, in the plaza. Why did we move to Sonoma? There are four C's, community, Tuesday evenings in the plaza, just look at them. It's like a European village. It's a cultural town. The culture, we have a world-class contemporary art museum for a town of 10,000 people. Linda Keaton is a major, she's a fabulous art historian and very bold. I joined the art museum when I saw the Haley. I'd studied Haley when I was in college art and I was blown away that a town would, let, would have something like that. The Community Art Center, there are artists who are guiding the art center, the community center who have studied at Alfred University, one of the premier contemporary ceramics programs in the world. And then there's climate, location, wine, history. We all live here for those reasons. I'd like to reflect as an art educator on what we're doing here. It's good for communities to have dialogue about art. It's not great for city council 
to have dialogues about art. It's better to have an art commission to be able to discuss things and present to you. We are talking tonight about aesthetics. It's a field of philosophy, uh, an art field of philosophy, which discusses the beauty and the purpose of art. It's a field of ethics, and this can be taught to children in our community. And the very act of public art helps children to understand how to discuss art. And it's like traffic, uh, like traffic safety, design review, environment, and planning commissions. It's good to put those discussions in the hands of professionals. 15 seconds. So uh, basically my background is from an art town. Uh, we hired a cultural planner in 1985 and it was the second city in the country to start a 1% for the arts program. We created a site plan mm -hmm. and that's probably what we need to be working on right now is to think about where the entry points in the downtown should be and where you place art. I am highly in favor of this incredible opportunity to put these beautiful pieces in the horseshoe of the plaza. All right, next we have Ken Stokes. And given the lateness of the hour, I'll encourage all of our commenters to stay within the three minute time limit, please. Thank you, we're on to Ken Stokes. Uh, thank you, Mayor and members of the council. My name is Ken Stokes. I moved here together with my wife in 2012 and we live on Brazil Street. I apologize for the frog that's crept into my throat in the last two hours that I've been sitting here before my computer. But anyway, I recognize that even after nine years living here, we're still newcomers. And so I'm speaking tonight as both a local resident and more importantly, a member of the board of the directors uh, of, of the SVMA. When we first began to house hunt here and consider moving to the area in 2010, we were greatly impressed by the variety and quality of the cultural offerings in Sonoma. We discovered so much more than the great wine and weather that we expected. Perhaps the most obvious was the warm and welcoming hometown feel of Sonoma, made so evident by the Tuesday night farmer's market and the 4th of July parade and celebration. But we were also attracted by things like the Sonoma International Film Festival, the Plain Air Festival, the Community Center, and of course the SVMA, but more recently also the Transcendence Theater Company, all of which feature programming and entertainment that is truly world-class and something you'd ex not expect to find in a town of our size. So after moving here, we were of course very happy to see the SVMA expand its community engagement to include the public art program. And that was before I became a member of the board. And again, by any objective standard, it's an impressive gift to the community for both visitors and residents alike. For this reason, I ask for you as a council to grant permission for prominent display of public art that will be on temporary display. I'm not speaking to the aesthetics of any particular piece, but simply the concept behind the program. Allowing the placement on the town's front lawn will have many benefits. Among them, the high visibility of this location will offer a clear invitation to both residents and visitors to engage with the art. As the mayor pointed out earlier, it will provide a photo opportunity unique to Sonoma, whereby our historic city hall, perhaps the most prominent and defining feature of our town, will be featured in the thousands of photographs that will undoubtedly be taken, forever, forever linking the public art program to the town of Sonoma. Third, it will assure appropriate recognition and thank you to the generous artists whose work will be featured, honoring the quality of their work and announcing to the world that Sonoma welcomes and is proud to host them on behalf of the community and finally, just as is often said that success breeds success, the proud and prominent display of art this year on the front lawn will no doubt make it easier to continue to attract and encourage other prominent artists to participate in the public art program in the future. Again, I thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Ken, appreciate it. Can you hear me? Um, okay. Hello, my name is Kathleen Watson, and I want to thank you for allowing me to speak to you this evening. Um, thank you to the mayor and to the city council members. Um, I have lived in Sonoma Valley for 27 years, and I have volunteered at the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art for the last 10 years. 
And currently I am chair of the volunteer council and I have been chair for two years. And I have recently been elected to the board of directors. I have, and I'm kind of, I wanna make this light and to the point, I have firsthand knowledge of leading tours of the sculpture exhibits through the plaza. It has been an honor and a privilege. And one of that is it's an honor to work with the city to bring art out into the plaza and to have that collaboration with the city and the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art. Um, I have been a guide for those tours and it's been a lot of residents, a lot of people visiting the town and it's always just generated an incredible amount of enthusiasm, a little bit of controversy at times and I think it's just really important to the livelihood of our town to um, bridge culturally that engagement with the museum and the city plaza. So I am all in favor of this collaboration and having these artworks uh, in such a prominent location. Um, we talked, you've talked in the staff reporting about visibility and Broadway is being the gateway to the plaza the front lawn is the front door. It's the front entry, it's the doormat. It is where you get the backdrop to take some beautiful pieces of art and prominently display them. And there are some safety issues. I think those can be addressed in terms of the actual location of where these sculpture pieces will be, but they're exciting. They're mysterious. They make you wanna go in and, and, and investigate the plaza in a much more lively and um, and authentic way. I think this is the perfect pairing at this time after the pandemic to just give a spark of joy to the city of Sonoma. So I really would love if you would consider approving uh, the location of these pieces of sculpture that the museum has asked you to. And I think Linda, um, from my experience with Linda, is she takes great care in how the sculptures are sited, because she is being very attentive to the uh, the installation requirements, access to the different sites, and how they relate to existing plant material, sight lines, shadow lines, all of those things that a curator brings to knowing the right location for this. So, I um, I got... hope you approve this. Am I speaking too long? Your time has expired, yep. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Next up we have, looks like La, La Vie. La Vie. It, it, it's, it's actually, can you hear me? It's for Hanukkah. I, I'm sorry. Oh, I know. okay. Hi okay, there. Great. It, well, yeah, somehow or another. It shows up as lovey. Um, yes, so Veronica Annapolis here. Um, I'm a retired designer, author, and college level teacher. Currently, I'm on the uh, Cultural and Fine Arts Commission, and I'm also a uh, working fine artist. So, good evening, Council, and thank you for listening to this very, very important topic. Um, allowing temporary public art in the plaza and in the horseshoe is really a community endorsement and support of public art in our area. And as we know, art is entirely subjective um, and there are people who are going to like, dislike, love, and even hate um, the the placement and the sculptures that have been chosen for those areas. However, that that instigates a dialogue within the community and you're not going to please everyone. Art is kind of like politics, you know? <laughs> it's, you're not always going to uh, find full consensus. Um, the, the second issue that I would like to discuss is how we go about doing this for the future so that we don't come to the council to for these kinds of decisions so what organizations decide who goes what where and more importantly why um, it's in the past it's been a collaboration between the svma 
um, the city staff and the CFAC. This year, the CFAC was not brought into the original meetings um, for whatever reasons, whether it be COVID, et cetera. But um, we, we, as the CFAC, I don't feel um, are, we're in, we're not in a position to develop public right. policy. Um, this was this was um, was outlined in my letter. It's outside of the scope, expertise, and mandate of the CFAC. A public art policy should be a subset of a cultural plan, which would require an organization not constrained by the Brown Act and would require a separate standalone budget and a certain standalone coalition or commission. Am I over? 15 seconds, rep. Okay, so I, I think that we need to work on um, how we're going to decide in the future um, many, many questions, but mostly public art and its placement. Thank you. Appreciate your comments. And next we'll move on to Claudia Sims. Oh no, Miki, sorry, Miki. Miki, if you could unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? I can indeed. Okay, thank you. My name is Mikey Shulevi. I'm a Chinese American artist and a museum educator working for Sonoma Valley Museum of Art. And I've lived in the area since 1987. We're in the process of reviving ourselves and our towns coming out of hiding to embrace a world that has been shared virtually and that has been globally altered. While we comprehend our year long frustrations, pain and loss, and as we move forward to regain function efficiently and creatively, there are many things we have learned during this time of COVID that I call on the council to remember, to consider and to act upon. We have confirmed that humankind is an adaptable animal. We are flexible. We are empathetic. We can see what happens to students who strive to learn in person and then remotely. We have seen how the shutdown has affected our businesses the differences between takeout and eating in a restaurant, to see images of family rather than to be with family, to see pictures of art in nature on computers and mobile devices versus seeing the mountain and the deer and the painting, the lack of authenticity to know a thing in real in front of us. We understand loneliness and isolation and the need to come together and be together. We took advantage of specific experiences to become moments of learning. We took opportunities to try things differently, to get food delivered, how to live with the unknown without our families and without our friends, how to bring back the parts of our lives no matter how curtailed, how to raise money for others and support our neighbors. We pared down the fluff of life to get to the most essential content and skills. So many rules, traditions, and ways of doing things have had to be tossed out. And as we've come back to some kind of normal flow, which of these rules and traditions must be the same? The lawn of the plaza turned out to be a great space of opportunity, the alternate space that gave us moments of learning. We hold public events there. We sent messages to our first responders. And when we needed it, we shared expressions of love and courage when we thought it seemed inexpressible. I'm here to talk to you about the placement of two enigmatic grand scale ceramic yeah. sculptures on the lawn of the Sonoma Plaza. And all of our life's disruptions and all the assaults on truth and all the sickness and in ill health and all our separations from hate and division, art fosters understanding between communities and helps us express gratitude during difficult time. Art reminds us that we're not alone and that we share a universal I human you experience. Wrap your, wrap your comments, please. The plaza lawn is gifted with a three-way stop, a slow traffic, large generosity of space for wandering about the center. And the purpose of our request is about an authentic experience and not a virtual one. It's the central heart of the city. 
please wrap yeah. up your comments. We're trying to make sure that everybody has the ability to public comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I thought I timed this at three minutes. So significant able, over let me just leave you with the what Kaneko says about his work then. No. Am I making a we move on to the next commenter. Thank you. All right. We're going to go ahead and bring in Claudia Sims. I'm really not trying to be rude, folks, but it's uh, 818. And right now we're trying to get through additional agenda items. We have three additional agenda items after this one. Um, so if you can keep your comments a little shorter, we'd really appreciate it. You support it on the front lawn. That's great. Um, and uh, we'd, we'd love to hear from you, but we've got a three minute time limit so we can respect the, the time of the council members and the time of the public and make sure that everybody has a, a ability to make a comment. We've got several other items that are gonna come up that are gonna be uh, important and people wanna comment on. The parklets are gonna be a long public comment session as well. Um, and it's already 8.20. Um, so- Mayor we, Harvey, can yes. we get a show of hands of how many more people wanna comment on this item? Just raise their hands. We've got, uh, three more that wanna comment, including Claudia. And I don't know if people will add after that. So we've had a number of commenters who are going over time significantly. <laughs> And um, I, I apologize that it's 30 seconds, but you can always use to meet with a council member before items if you need to say a lot more. Um, okay, with that, we'll go ahead and bring Claudia Sims on. Welcome to the council. Meeting. Thank you for the time. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. I'm a longtime volunteer at the Sonoma Valley Museum of Art, and I'm going to keep it very short. I'm going to put say that I am in support and I did uh, most of the things everyone else has said. And I would like to circle back to something that Mayor Harvey said. It shows us ahead of our time. It gives people a, an additional reason besides food and wine and history and our weather to come back to Sonoma and to talk about Sonoma. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Um, next we have, looks like May Ark from the Sonoma Chamber. Thank you, Mayor Harvey. I appreciate that. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council members. I'll be very brief. Um, I just wanted to register my support for this item. Um, I think public art is always important, but especially this year after we've had such a hard time gathering and enjoying our public spaces. Also, art is a huge driver of economic uh, success and the cultural and heritage tourists are the gold standard. They are exactly who we want visiting here. They stay longer and spend more money and they come at different times of the day. So uh, thank you to Linda and SBAMA team and urge your support on this. Thanks. Next we have Suzanne Braga. I'm being terrible at butch I'm butchering people's names tonight, so I apologize. Suzanne, if you could unmute yourself. Okay. There we are. Got it. People humanize our plaza and so do artists. And the location of the Coneco, Coneco two, two heads at the location at the, where uh, the museum and a majority of us would like them to be located looks for people when they're coming into town and they think, look, what's going on? Finally, and I'll make this extremely short, of great importance today, public art is a well accepted principle of urban design. We have little in our town of Sonoma. I cherish the times when our local museum offers to bring artists to the plaza for all of us to enjoy. So I hope you'll take the expertise of the museum and the commission that the location will be just spectacular for this particular show. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Looking to see, we see nobody else raising their hand. I uh, will go ahead and close public comment and bring it back to the council for comments. Can I comment? Yeah, go ahead. Great. I think this is exciting. I support having the art. I think based on the um, types of public comment we got, I think that people misunderstood that somehow the council has voted against this and we need to be uh, 
yelled at until we can understand why it's good. That never happened. This is the first time we've ever had it. And every time we've ever had public art come before us, we've always approved it. And so certainly it's our job to take into consideration the safety concerns raised by our public works director. That's something we have a obligation as a public entity to do. Uh, and to the extent that they can be moved back and those safety concerns can be met so that we don't, uh, people have people don't get hurt, then I would support it and I'm fine with that. But I just wanna clarify, I appreciate all the public comments and the passion, but uh, this city council has never, not even once hinted that we don't want public art in the plaza and we have universally supported it. So I hope that that is clear and I am so confused. And if you were informed that we were against it and you needed to come here and yell at us, please email me and tell me why you got that perspective because I am a little bewildered by the um, uh, almost vitriol of some of the comments tonight. But I'm very excited about it. Linda, thank you for bringing it here. I'm sure it'll be wonderful for our town. I can't wait to see it. Thank you. Great, other comments from council? Go ahead, Jack. I don't understand uh, the Amy just mentioned because this project it's too good to lose for them. They so that I really appreciate it. You know, Linda and the Lisa, all in the public in the comments. Uh, you tell the people use your heart, use your soul, and also especially at this time, after the pandemic, the people need a break. And people need healing. People need to have some positive, fresh stuff to come with us. That is the best one. Thank you for your. You know, great efforts uh, take the hours, hours, the days and the days, consider everything. And also another thing is, you know, this kind of art represents our the city. Our city is the tradition, you know, the, and also represents the quality of the life in Sonoma and also and represents inclusiveness and the love. Thank you again. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jack. Uh, Councilmember Brigdang, go ahead. Uh, any other comments? Councilmember Agramonte, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Well, I'm very excited about this. Um, and I think uh, the two busts will be very exciting. You know, during the fires, people, acrobats from all over came to stand on Vallejo's head. So I who have to understand that there are very talented acrobatic people who practice that. You can only anticipate what might happen. And I think it's wonderful. I can't wait to see the art. I always enjoy it. People who come to visit us from out of town, we always take them to your exhibitions. So I'm very excited about this. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Agramonte. Uh, Councilor Barnett. Vice Mayor Agramonte, I apologize. That's Councilor all right. Uh, thank you, Mayor Harvey. Um, as I discussed, I love public art. I'm very excited about our public art program. As Councilwoman Harrington said, this council has always supported public art, and I really love the temporary nature of our public art, that we are treated to such um, unique and amazing uh, pieces every year from different artists from around the world and from, and from our valley. And so I love our public art program. Obviously, in my view, the only controversy tonight was the placement of the public art in the in the horseshoe. Um, I, I do think staff's concern, public works concerns, are valid. I also think that um, you know we are going to be setting a precedent here. In my view, we've never had public art in the horseshoe that was not connected to some sort of community event, whether it was the film festival or the fires or the pandemic. And while I understand that there is a view out there that these heads will celebrate coming out of the pandemic. It is difficult for me. Again, I mean, obviously art is meant to uh, challenge people and get people thinking, but I don't understand obviously the direct connection um, of the heads to the pandemic. And maybe that's just me, maybe I'm just a lay person, but um, obviously this is gonna have support. I, uh, I do believe in our public art program, and I just want to caution, I am concerned, everyone that knows about this is out here um, supporting the art tonight, but most of our town has no idea this is going to happen. Um, and when they drive down Broadway after the installation, I guarantee you every single member of City Hall, including us, is going to hear about it. And so I look forward to hearing about that. 
and will uh, will trust the rest of my council and our arts community on this. Um, I spent some time in Santa Fe last fall, and Santa Fe is um, known for its art. And to some of the um, the comments from our public commenters and other council members, obviously Sonoma is known for wine and our history. And if we can somehow layer that in to be also known for art, and, and we're a vibrant arts community, I'm very excited about not only that. Uh, that identity for Sonoma, but the potential that has for our economic development as well. And so, again, I'm very concerned about the placement of these on the, uh, the the horseshoe. And perhaps in the future, we may have to revisit this. And maybe we basically are going to do one and done on this, see how it goes. But since it has the support, I do want to support our museum and Linda and the excellent institution we have there and the rest of our council members. And I will I will vote to support this. All right, thank you so much, uh, members of council. I, I really appreciate it. I, I will be supporting this tonight. I think it's important, um, as uh, council member Harrington mentioned, that we do um, we do consider uh, traffic safety concerns and, and the rest of that. So if the, the statues can be moved back a bit, um, I think that that would be uh, appreciated. And I, I would encourage um, Ms. Keaton and uh, our our plan or our director uh, Ferguson to work together on on kind of figuring out something that might work a little bit better. Allow them to take a picture of the plaza with the with the or the the city hall with the with the head statues and it should be good. I also appreciate the comments of my uh, fellow council member that if we do this, uh, put this art in that heads may roll. Um, and uh, so I want to make sure that that doesn't happen either. But I think you know that whole engendering conversation uh, due to art is always a great idea and something that we should support. So I'll be voting to support this as well. Uh, and if we could move for a roll call vote, I would appreciate it. Just to get. Uh, Oh, sorry, go ahead, Councilman Harrington. Oh, I just, were we giving a vote or direction or what was the? Action? Yeah, there actually is a resolution and uh, we were kind of waiting to see where you landed on the horseshoe question. And that would be point three in your resolution, which is now a series of blank lines. So. <laughs> um, yes, Councilman Burnett. Um, I'm sorry, and I don't have the resolution in front of me, but does the resolution allow the placement for this particular year or just in the future, I mean, are we creating a public arts policy through this resolution? No. Okay, so just we, we can be clear if that's what you wish that this is a 2001 installation that can be in the horseshoe, and I'm I'm going to wordsmith with you right now. Okay. This 20. would be point three of the resolution. The this these public art pieces can be in the horseshoe. Um, they'll be placed after consultation with our public works director as to the best point of safety and uh they're they're then authorized then by the city council in that regard okay good well i'm glad i wouldn't want to get ahead of ourselves and and improve it for long term so may, may also mayor harvey yes uh, absolutely. and it, as we move forward there was a um, letter from veronica from the cultural and fine arts commission i do need to thank perhaps the council should talk about our public art policy and really sort of create that. But I was under the, or I heard that we're not allowed to put public art in the north quadrants of the plaza, and I don't know why. And so as we revisit that, I, I would be supportive of public art throughout all the quadrants of the plaza. And I, I don't know what the policy is on that, but it sounds like we need to revisit that. Can I just ask a question? So um, there will be a separate contract that the city manager will do with the museum um, about the things like replacing the grass and the indemnity and all that. Is that how it works? That's how it's worked in the past. Yeah. Just like a separate agreement. Yes. And we're not going to approve that. That's going to be signed by Dave or who? I uh, believe the that resolution does not contemplate that. If you'd like to include that, that no, I don't. I, I don't need to see it again. I just wanted to know the procedure. Well, let's make sure it's crystal clear. That always helps me. Hmm. Um, I'm going to share. I'm going to screen. Go ahead, City Clerk Bar. In the past, it's yeah. always been signed by the City Manager, but the um, Jeff Walter, the City Attorney, reviews it uh, before she it's signed off of. And I believe Jeff Walter actually has to sign the document itself. I'm going to share the screen briefly that includes the whereas to the sorry the, res, the resolve to the resolution. Sorry. 
So, because this resolution does look at um, directing the Cultural and Fine Arts Commission to make the remaining final selection and their location in collaboration with city staff, directs the review and update of the public art policy, including the incorporation of the temporary art program and approved art installation sites. But, and then third would be the approved art installation sites for 2021 only include the horseshoe and the horseshoe placement shall be made in consultation with the safe consultation with the public works director as to the safety as the most safe placement. All that seem clear. Very clear. All right, I think we're all comfortable. I'm not hearing any uncomfortability. Kelsey, you're right with it. Okay, good. Uh, let's go for a roll call vote to approve that language and um, this item. Can somebody or somebody make a motion? We need one of those first. So we, I put in an all motion. Boom. And can we get a second? I'll second it. All right, great. Uh, motion by Councilmember Ding, seconded by Councilmember Harrington, and we'll go for a roll call vote. Councilmember Ding? Aye. Councilmember Barnett? Aye. Councilmember Harrington? Aye. By Agramonti? Aye. Mayor Harvey? Yes. So, Thank you. Mayor, Mayor Harvey, I wanted to bring something to your attention. Yes, ma'am. The schedule. You know, we usually have a, I don't know what the expression is. We're supposed to look at it, the, the, the time. Right, oh, there's nine o'clock. Is, is, is typically the second time. I cannot stay past nine o'clock tonight. I have to be in a deposition at nine in the morning and I cannot, I've been in this since 5.30, so I cannot work a 17 hour day and then go to work in the morning at a deposition for <laughs> preparation for a trial. I can't do it. So I, I at nine o'clock, I have to leave this meeting. Okay. And I'm guessing that item 6.2 is going to have a lot of public comment. Um, are you comfortable with us proceeding and just doing this, uh, doing item 6.2 anyway, knowing that you're probably not going to be there to vote? Uh, yeah, I don't know how to handle that, but it I, looks like there, I don't know what items, but it looks like there are 41 participants. I don't even know the what parklets. The, item 6.2 is the parklet question, which I think the majority of people are here. We just, the reason we're in this situation was we pulled so many items on consent calendar. And then we had a lot of comment on that. And then a lot of comment on the arts, which I think was a little bit surprising. So, uh, and I'm, I'm not a spoil sport, but I think, you know, we've tried to do this to stick with some kind of schedule. It has nothing to do with anybody or anyone. It's just, we need a reminder. Mr. Mayor and Council, the parklet item is not going to turn into a pumpkin right away. You could, if you wanted to continue that to the first meeting in May. In other words, there's not a, there's not a decision point there that's going to collapse on us in May or June. I feel bad for the members of the public who showed up to comment on this item. Frankly, um, in some ways, it's better because we've we've heard some from some re retailers that they were a little bit shocked and, and wanted a little bit more time on this one. Um, so I think there's good reasons and bad reasons, but I do feel bad for people who stayed on this meeting since we started at six for two and a half hours to comment on this and, and aren't going to be able to. I am definitely sympathetic to that, but I cannot work 17 hours today and be fresh for a deposition in the morning. I cannot do it. And so I'm going to have to put my professional life before tonight. So I would what? prefer not to have it voted on when I'm not here because it's an important matter. But if the council feels like they want to go forward, that is in your discretion. Okay. Well, in the interest of making sure that Councilmember Harrington has the right to vote on such an important item, um, we'll go ahead and, and I apologize. Uh, that, well, let me ask council, are you guys comfortable with punting it um, or just for you know one month until the first meeting in, in May? Well, I think I, I understand what Davis, David, Mr. Kiff is saying is that it's not really time sensitive, although right. serious. Um, so I'm comfortable, you know, I would, I would prefer that Amy be, that Council Member Harrington be part of this. Jack, comments? I agree. Yes, I agree. Okay. Great. So I think we have to motion, we have to affirmatively do that, uh, moving it to the to May, and we do allow public comment during that period. 
the public comments are expected to be about whether or not you want us to move it to May. So if you want to call in to support the parklets, please, please save that for May so that we can get our other two items done. I'm just asking you public as a favor. Of course, I'm not going to shut you off before your time. Um, and we're when we move this item, what we're doing here is we're taking the item 6.2, which is a discussion about the alfresco dining and the parklets. We're moving it till May 1st so that Councilmember Harrington can participate. There will be time for public comment on that date. And of course, if you have significant comments that you want to make, I encourage you to reach out to your council members in the interim. Everybody here is willing to meet people for coffee and have a chat, or if not in person, I forget that we're in COVID, Zoom or a phone call, all these are appropriate methods. Um, and so I think we're going to move in this direction to, to, to move the item to May 1st, the, the first meeting in May. And we are going to open up public comment to have a discussion to, for the public to comment on whether or not we should move the item. Um, if you if you if you could, I would encourage you to wait till May first to make your comments. But uh, you will do as you will, um, and I uh, will go ahead and open up public comment. And I, I want to check with the city attorney. Am I doing things in the proper order right now? You are, and you can limit the public discussion to one minute, given this is a very finite question. One minute should be I will fine shorten the public comment to one minute in the, in the interest of that. And, and I apologize, public. I promise you that when we do this meeting in May, we will have a, a three-minute public comment as per normal, but we're trying to save time here and get through these other two items and bring this on later. So we'll open public comment. I see Ryan uh, Laley. Thank you, Mayor Harvey and council members. Um, is it possible to make this item agenda earlier in the agenda during that May 1st meeting? Yes. That's a great idea. We'll make sure it's the first item of the regular calendar. Mm -hmm. Certainly. Thank you. Great. And next we have Mark from the Sonoma Chamber. Good evening again, Mayor and Council Members. Uh, I, I just wanted to throw out there, I do know that there's a number of businesses who are holding off on making some decisions with regard to this item. And uh, so with all due respect to Amy, I just wanted to throw out there the timeliness of this. This is uh, a difficult thing. I understand rules are rules. Um, so support whatever decision you make, but this is going to create complications for people. Okay. Um, seeing no one else rise, I appreciate public for participating in that. And, and I do understand that people are making decisions around this. We respect the seriousness of moving an item, especially an item as serious as this. But I think it is important that we have the full council here. You never know how a majority is going to go. And I think it's important that elected members have the opportunity to weigh in on items that are this important. And I also respect that everybody's a volunteer here. Uh, we are not paid council members. This is not a full-time job. We all have uh, other responsibilities to family and work. Um, and we all have to find a way to balance that. And sometimes it conflicts. And so obviously we want to respect Amy's time and her ability to do her job and do it well. Um, the one that she, that, that pays her bill. So that's, that's uh, very important uh, that that goes successfully tomorrow night. So we'll go ahead with that. If we can have a motion to kick this to the first meeting in May. Move to, uh, move, move to, uh, move to move. Move to move the, move to uh, have this issue brought back May first. People have to understand there still is there are certain things we have to go through and consent agenda. So then, as you've offered, maybe it would be close to the top. Probably the first on the regular calendar. And I think it should be clear it's, it's May three, not May one. So there's May no three. May, three. May three is the first meeting date in, in May. Second. Uh, all right, we have a roll call vote. Council Member Ding. Aye. Council Member Barnett. Aye. Council Member. Me. Aye. <laughs> Vice Mayor Agramonte. Aye. Mayor Harvey. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Great. On item 6.3, um, discussion. Consideration possible action to adopt a resolution establishing appeal fees for land use planning applications and permits that and that the activity described above is not a project. We'll go ahead and move it on to our associate planner. It says associate planner, but I think you're the planning director, Mr. David Storr. Well, we'll go ahead and give it to Christina. How's that? We'll just call oh, Christina, Christina is gonna run it. Where is she? Yeah. Bring her on. <laughs>
Hi, everyone. Thank you for your time this evening and apologies for the cereal in the background and the kids that might come through at any minute during bedtime. Hopefully they're asleep. I am going to share my screen in just a moment. Oops. It's not design review hearing. And Rebecca, if I, um, at the end, I might need you to unshare my screen because of my dual, dual screen settings. But we are here tonight to discuss appeal fees. In fall of 2018, the City Council ad up, adopted an updated fee schedule in an effort to recover staff time associated with you're processing. You're, you're not sharing if you think you're sharing. Oops. Thank you. I noticed that the second that the planning item comes up, the people in the waiting room went way down. <laughs> All right, is, is that working now? All right, uh, as uh, back where I was starting from, in 2018, the city council adopted a new fee schedule in an effort to recover costs associated with those uh, planning permits. The amount of the Appeal fee was not changed at that time, which is for a flat fee of $400. And it was anticipated that additional review and research was going to be needed. And so the can was kicked down the road. Discussions on appeal fees was also deferred because the full cost of the appeals is very high. It was identified in 2018 that the cost of an appeal was approximately $8,500. So this is, um, there we go. Uh, this is the adopted 2018 fee sheet. And so we're, what we're going to be discussing tonight is this last line under the fixed fees, appeal fee, $400. And note two, Reese, cost recovery and policies regarding appeals will be reviewed at a later date with city council. And so that's what we're here to do tonight is to, to review this issue. Over the past few years, the city has spent a considerable amount of time and um, staff time on appeals. And city council recently requested that the zoning code ad hoc tackle this issue and make recommendations to city council. City council has reviewed the existing appeal fee and a history of our appeals over the last five years or so. They have reviewed the appeal fee and structure for many adjacent cities and counties and have recommended that the city council adopt a tiered appeal system approach based on permit type and residency, whether a, an appellant is within or outside of the city of Sonoma. This is just a snapshot graphic to show um, what other jurisdictions in Sonoma County and adjacent to Sonoma County, what their appeal fee structure is like. The gray lines indicate flat fee structures, so Katati, Healdsburg, Sebastopol, Windsor, and Napa are all on a fixed fee basis. Where there are multiple colored lines, the blue indicates the low cost recovery scenario. So in some of these instances, they did differentiate between residents versus non-residents. Sometimes it was an immediate uh, landowner, a neighbor got a, got a discount. In a couple cases, it was uh, based on whether or not the appellant was a developer. And so the, in some of the lines, you'll see arrows, and these are indicating that the, the actual number is far higher. So as I mentioned in the beginning, the actual cost of an appeal is about $8,500. So for all of the numbers that I'm going to be discussing tonight, the assumption was that the cost of an appeal for all of these jurisdictions would be the same. And so some uh, jurisdiction, most of the jurisdictions with the cost recovery, the orange uh, arrow, they're having a full cost recovery at about $8,500. So as you can see where the city of Sonoma is now is below the median and the average of even just the flat fees. So the $400 uh, appeal fee is quite low compared to our neighboring jurisdictions. And then uh, the takeaway is that some jurisdictions are doing flat fees, some are not. The city of Santa Rosa, I believe, is the highest, and their cost recovery um, is is uh, a, quite 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 steep. This is another <laughs> view. Of, I'm sorry. 
Could I ask a quick question? Of course. Uh, can you show that chart again? When a developer appeals, since they have to do cost recovery, are you saying that their appeal is limited to just the cost of the appeal or no, they have to pay for staff time in relation to everything with their, with their project? That is probably a better question for our city attorney. Because I assumed if they appealed because they have to pay for all our staff time that they would be paying actual costs. Jeff? As it stands now, the my understanding is the appeal field is charged is the charge is uh, charged to any other person. Isn't that true, uh, Christina? The, well, the actual appeal fee, I think what Amy is mentioning is the, that while the appeal is being processed, that would the applicant be charged for that time as, as well? Is that what you're saying? Uh, yeah, I'm saying that Robert? like if you're a member of the public and you file an appeal, all you pay is the appeal fee. But if you're a developer, you have to pay for all staff time in relation to your project. So in addition to the appeal fee, you're paying for all staff time. Is that true? I think it will depend on what what permit was appealed. If it's a flat fee, then we don't have a cost recovery agreement. So for a signed permit or minor design review, landscape plan, things like that, if those are appealed, we don't have a mechanism for recovering those costs. So like for something like um, Shock and Hill, would we have charged staff time for that under our current? I think so. Probably we have a cost recovery agreement that uh, would include uh, the fees that the City would incur in processing the appeal, yes. Okay, so we have a flat fee for people who, residents who appeal and also for kind of small projects and then for larger projects, the developer would have to pay any staff time. Is that right? Well, no, there are some particular kinds of projects where the applicant, be it a developer or a homeowner, pays a flat fee for the processing of the entire uh, project. And that's the only fee that that applicant pays, whether it's appealed or not. Right. And I can I can bring those up. Those so these are all the flat fees. So a music license, temporary use permit, a deferral agreement, sign review, and then some of the minor design reviews, home occupation permit, sidewalk seating, zoning permit. So those are most of our small permits. The uh, cost recovery permits are the the tentative maps, use permits variances, plan development permits, those are the ones that typically are more controversial and more likely to be appealed. As Christina get this is David, as Christina gets towards the last slide, you'll see that we've broken the appeals into those very categories. And so um, this, Amy did, uh, excuse me, Council Member Harrington, did that answer your question? <laughs> I think so. Yeah, I just, I, I mean, I think the answer is that it's more nuanced than just a flat fee and it kind of depends on the project. So you can't answer every possible project, but it's both. Yeah. Uh, this, the slide before you right now is an overview of the data that the previous chart came from and just wanted to show some of the thought that went into the ad hoc committee's discussions and recommendations. So the summary is that the average appeal fee is about $1,000, $967. The median appeal fee was about $496. There are the jurisdictions that have a breakdown for, for resident, different fees for residents versus non-residents include Petaluma, Santa Rosa, and Roner Park. Those that have a cost recovery structure include Cloverdale, Petaluma, Santa Rosa, Roner Park, and Sonoma County. The, uh, before you now is the recommendation of the ad hoc committee. So there are different fees for a resident versus a non-resident, and we have also broken it down into major and minor permits. So for a minor permit, a tentative map, a use permit requiring a categorical exemption under CEQA, variants, Lot line adjustment, sign review, design review, that would be a $500 fee. For a non-resident, it would be $1,000. For a resident for a major permit, so that would be a subdivision map, a use permit with an initial study mitigated negative declaration or an EIR that requires CEQA review. 
planned unit development, pre-zoning annexation, general, not general, uh, planner rezoning. Um, those types of projects would be $1,000 for a resident and $5,000 for a non-resident. And so this is uh, kind of splitting the baby a little bit. If you, you wanna say it's raising all of the base fees to be more representative of, of the neighboring jurisdictions. So the 500 and the thousand dollars are representative of the median and the average. And then at getting towards a cost, a little bit of a cost recovery, that $5,000 non-resident of a major permit would, uh, the goal would be to have a, some form of cost recovery. It would not be 100%. So the summary of the ad hoc's recommendation was to move from a single flat fee to a tiered system with lower costs for small projects so that it would be easier for a neighbor to appeal a fence or uh, addition design review, something that's directly affecting an individual property owner. There would also be a lower cost for city of Sonoma residents rather than outside um, organizations that are, are coming in and appealing a project. We would raise the minimum fee for residents from $100, so from 400 to 500 and it would raise the minimum fee for non-residents from 400 to 1,000. Overall, these changes would help to offset appeal costs to the city and would bring us into a, a level that's more compatible with our adjacent jurisdiction. Are there questions? None for me. None for me. No, oh, I'm good. All right. Hey. Yeah, questions? I, yeah, I'm concerned about, because the race is not a very big, it's not a significant, just only in the by $100. And the, yeah, because, you know, inflation also, yeah, would be, you know, considered as well. But here, the, I have a point is, you know, the, on the local the people, how can it be easy? gotten a chance to express themselves, you know, the, 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 that means, you know, the, the cost to stand up and say something uh, at the court, that is the, you know, we needed to protect this kind of the, and the right for our the local residents. Uh, because I, you know, this is uh, $500 or $400, or even the five thousand dollars for the developer for the rich people, it means nothing. You know, increase whatever. You know, they want to get in a project. But for the for our the for the, the developers neighbors for average people and in a town that is maybe especially for the young people maybe they were the lost the chance to to stand up to see something differently. So that is my concern. And I look at it from the 400 to 500, you know, technically that is fine, you know, the, but we cannot do going further. If we do go further, where the damage and the, 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 the you know, the people's ability and the participate and the uh, democracy in the process. That is a minor concern. Thank you. Great. Um, any other questions from council? Go ahead, Councilor. I, I don't have any questions, actually. I just, or is this time for council comment on this item or? No, we got questions, then we do public comment, bring it back for comment. No questions, thank you. Councilor Argamonte. I'm trying to make mine a question. I need an attorney right now. <laughs> comment time and make a comment. Um, I just want to know how do people feel if my freedom's taken away, you get my freedom. That's what I think of appeals. People appeal and you take my freedom away. It affects affordable housing. It affects a lot of things, right? <laughs> That's my question. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm Thank finished. You. All right, we'll go ahead and open it up for public comment. Seeing nobody rise. 
Let's go ahead and bring it back to the council. Uh, council member comments. I have a comment. Um, uh, hang on one sec. Thanks. I guess my comment is I know that it's really important to council member Agramani that we increase these fees and I don't see why we wouldn't be in line with other small cities um, if we're below everyone so I don't have a objective problem with that I know it's important to her I will say though that um, in my first term there were a lot of appeals and a lot of them had merit and so I think the um, the question was, and even the things that got appealed on when they were, when lawsuits were brought after they were appealed, those lawsuits, some of them had merit. And so I think there weren't a lot of frivolous appeals. There were a lot of appeals. And I think that um, we should, we should be looking into why so many projects that were uh, relatively defective made their way to the city council. That's probably a good question. Um, and I also think the timeline for getting um, uh, appealed matters to the council. Maybe that's something we also have to work on so that if somebody files an appeal, it doesn't hang it up for six months or a year that we see it sooner so that if there is an appeal, we can get kind of like a final adjudication on the project in a quicker manner. Um, but, uh, you know, an increase to kind of keep up with the cost of inflation um, and to stay on par with other cities is fine. I think it would be dangerous to try and task um, members of the public with cost recovery since their interest is in protecting the public, but most people's interests who are um, going to be appealed are developers who are making profit, so they don't have the same interest. Um, and then I guess I would just say the final thing about residents versus the valley, um, you know, uh, since we do have so many people that are um, not represented by a local city and they have a really vested interest in what happens within city limits, I don't know that I'm comfortable with a dramatic uh, increase in cost on people from the valley, given that we're kind of one community. So I don't know the answer to that, but I don't want to say that somebody who lives just outside the city limits but spends all their tax dollars in our city should have a dramatically increased burden about um, having a say about what happens in their community. So those are kind of my broad thoughts. Not, I don't know if that's super helpful, but if there's a number that kind of works for everybody, I'm open to some amount of increase. Yeah, I think the thought of the ad hoc there was that if you're outside the city, you probably know somebody in the city who could help you appeal, but I understand what you're saying uh, for sure. Maybe it doesn't have to be so extreme. Sorry, Councilmember Barnett, you had your hand up, apologize. Um, yes, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think Councilwoman Harrington nailed everything right on the head. And I support basically everything she said. I actually would be open to changing the in city versus out of city to the school district, which is the valley. I, I do believe that people in our community, even if they don't live within the city limits, should be open to something like that. And so I'm open to that if the rest of the council does, and then outside the school district. Um, but, but Vice Mayor Agramani um, asked us to look at this and when we looked at it, I think we realized that our appeal fees are um, lower than comparable communities. Um, for example, Healdsburg and mm -hmm. Sebastopol, in my view, are the most comparable communities within Sonoma County to us. And those are also communities that definitely believe in due process and the right of people to weigh in. And they both have flat fees over $1,000. In my view, we've kept many appeals to $500. We've only raised them from 400 to 500 for many sort of minor appeals. And the thinking of the ad hoc, and perhaps Mayor Harvey can also weigh in on this as he's also a member of the ad hoc, is that major appeals at $1,000 is still average and sort of in line with Sebastopol and Healdsburg. But generally, many members of our community join an appeal and that we the last thing I want to do is put an appeal out of reach from someone in our in our community. And that's why we I do believe in due process. And I do I do believe due process and being involved and in, in speaking your mind is a constitutional right. And many people would also think, you know, a constitutional right is, is your right to enjoy your own property. But if you want to build a fence on your property, you have to take out a permit and you have to pay for it. If you want a variance on something on your own property, you have to take out a permit and you have to pay for it. And so 
I don't think there should, I, I think the fact that you have to pay for an appeal is, is fair. Um, I do believe if, I, I know Petaluma does this, if there's a way to pass on cost recovery to the applicant, I, I definitely support that. But I do believe this still allows the right of the public to due process, even with a higher appeal fee on most applications from 400 to 500 and from 400 to 1,000 for major appeals that, in our view, we assume many people will be involved in that appeal and perhaps the burden will be less because it will be divided among a larger group. And that was just the thinking of the ad hoc. I'm open to how the rest of the council thinks about it, but I do appreciate Vice Mayor Angravati asking us to look at it. And yeah, I, I'm really, I appreciate it because, you know, these are one of those holy things that you don't look at. So I'm appreciate, I really appreciate it. One of my issues for people for out from outside of the city is we, the taxpayers in the city of Sonoma incur those costs. So even if they have an appeal from outside and anyone can correct me, I would appreciate it. But someone from Boy Springs or Glen Ellen or something comes in and appeals a project and it has nothing to do with them. It's just they feel a certain way. They have a, um, a policy in their head what they think is right. But we are the ones that incur the cost, citizens here in the city of Sonoma, our taxpayers, not taxpayers from another county, um, from outside of the city. So, I mean, that's, I'm willing to come down possibly uh, maybe half up to 2,500, but I just think it's fair. You know, those are costs we have to incur, our taxpayers. Would you be open, Vice Mayor, to expanding the in-city to the school district? So that would include, you know, elements of our valley and then out of city, I mean, basically being outside the valley? Yes. I'm agreeable to it. I just think us even discussing the, it makes me happy. The school district would include Glen Ellen. Right. And, Boy and Kenwood. And they would get the same appeal fee as a resident of the city of Sonoma. So you support that? Because it seems like it's different than what you were saying before. Um, well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. You brought that to my attention. I know. I really... I don't know, I have a problem, you know, and thank you, uh, Council Member Barnett, but I have a problem with somebody who doesn't, doesn't even live in the city having be able to um, yield power over us. So I, I don't. Yeah, we can bring them down a bit. One of the things I was thinking about with the residential, like small scale project fees, is the way that the city border lines are drawn because they're kind of strange. And if you look at like Verano Avenue, you could certainly have a situation where somebody's trying to appeal something their direct neighbor is doing. And because the city line runs through like that little neighborhood, they they yeah. would have a thousand dollar appeal fee. So for me, I think I, I wish we could have clear definitions. <laughs> like if we could like specifically end at like where like Taco Bell and like you know, like that, that part and like, you know, the, the, the things are these more delineated lines. I would love to be able to include like basically like Shellville and, you know, like, uh, like Boys Hot Springs area for some of this kind of stuff. Um, and I think, you know, like when it comes to, I do agree with Councilmember Agramonte about the issues around, you know, housing development and stuff like that. These are multi-million dollar projects that are going forward that are trying to bring housing to their community and people are appealing it for, you know, reasons that are important to them, but may not be important to the broader community, right? And they have the right to do that, certainly, um, but it, it does derail process. And, and um, you know, I think Broadway MacArthur is a, is a good example. I personally spoke out against, I had spoke out against that project at public comment meetings. Um, and uh, now we've got so many members of our community and uh, members of the community appealed it. They had serious reasons and studied reasons why they felt that that was appropriate and why they thought the appeal was needed. ER complexities, all that kind of stuff. But our community is constantly acting, asking, why hasn't something been built there, right? And and I don't think that this raising this appeal fee would stop that, right? Uh, at all. I think I think there were problems with that project, and it also I think that members of our community can band together and, and cobble together a thousand dollars fairly easily. Um, so I think it's just it's kind of creating a little bit more fairness and discrepancy as far as like 
paying cost recovery. I do not support that for residents. I don't think an individual resident should be paying full cost recovery, but on a larger scale developer, I do think that they should be. Although it does kind of, we've seen this kind of difference in developer. There's people who are maybe a little bit smaller bore and they kind of have a, a softer relationship with the city. And there's people who come in threatening litigation from the get go and they're kind of a bigger, you know, more hardball type developer. And I think that these kinds of like cost recovery things kind of lean towards those larger kind of uh, more hardball developers and kind of turn people kind of, it, it gets rid of some of these mom and pop shops that might be there because they have these larger costs that they have to incur as a developer. And I, and I hear what so you're I don't think it should be on the, on the taxpayer because obviously they're going to make a profit at the end when they're, when they're successful with the project. And you should always be rolling in the potential cost of appeal into, you know, your profit margin and everything like that. So, so lots of comments. Um, I support this. I would be fine lowering the outside of uh, city limits appeals on the, um, for the commercial. So I would be fine with like, if you want to cut that in half to 2,500 and I'd be fine on the residential, just saying the same. Uh, outside resident or inside resident would be the same because I don't think there's a lot of cases where somebody from Glen Allen is going to be driving around and be like, oh, they're going to build a fence and I'm going to appeal that. Like, I don't think they're going to do an individual project. I could see it happening for a large scale project. But again, I, I really do feel like this is such a tight knit community that they're going to know somebody that's in the city of Sonoma, be able to reach out to them and say, hey, would you be the, the name on the appeal? And then, you know, I think I thank you. I really appreciate it. My my issue, of course, is with affordable housing. Everybody talks about it. We all support it. We there are some cities I can't say us go beyond NIMBY. I know about another one. Nope, not on planet Earth. People will use any excuse, any any excuse. And I really hope that this is something that will help us move forward on um, the issues that affect uh, what really is important for us is that our affordable housing, we each seem to be, you know, even workforce housing, there's not a lot of that either. So I appreciate your, the conversation. So um, I'm for, I'm still, are we still at $500? So 500 for residential, a thousand for uh, a larger scale project for residents. What I proposed was we'd make for the smaller scale, like your neighbor's building a fence type of appeal um, that, that we make resident, non-resident the same. And maybe we bring the non-resident down on the commercial side, which is right now at 1,000, 5,000 down to 2,500. All right, I'm good. Can we put up the, um, the slide again? Sure. And Kelso, I apologize. Kelso, yeah. back on. Okay, okay, sorry. Trying to make sure everybody gets in. Of course. There you go. That's the one. So okay. if you have a minor permit, we make the same. And then the major permit, we cut the non-resident in half. Okay. So for the first one, it's a thousand. And then the non-resident is 2,500. And then the next one is 500. And then what's the non-resident on that one? I'm saying 500. Okay. Just because okay. of that case where like you live on Verano and your neighbor's yeah. building a fence and technically you're not. No, I'm place. good with that. That makes sense. All right, cool. So uh, let me ask David and Christina, everybody clear about where the motion is heading here? We don't quite have a motion yet. Okay. David Storer. All right. Yeah, I think we understand it. Um, and Christina, I'm sure, is taking notes as well. Yep. Is and then we do want cost recovery on the developer side. On the major permit side, yeah. On the developer side, certainly. All right. We got a motion on this one? I think Mr. Barnett still has a question. Oh, sorry, Kelsey, I can't see you now. Go ahead. It's not a question. I, I just want to reiterate after some of this discussion what Councilwoman Harrington said at the beginning, that there is a view that the appeals we had were not a result of, you know, nitpicky members of our community, but a result of, quite frankly, failures in our planning process. And, um, and, I, and I actually do believe that was the case. And since we, in my view, have um, you know, new members in our planning team, I don't think you've seen as many appeals as we used to. And there's a different way that they've gone about it that I think has resulted in that. And so um, I'm happy that Vice Mayor Agramani brought this up because we have discovered that we are below neighboring and comparable communities when it comes to appeal fees. But I also think some of the appeals that have 
taken place in our community over the last few years as Councilwoman Harrington had serious merit and were and were a result of, in my view, failures in our planning process. So and we'll see going forward. We haven't had any major project approvals recently either. So <laughs> since we had the new the new uh, planning director and, and things like that. Well, we had the um, Mockingbird. That's pretty yeah. big. That was yeah. big. It's all single family homes though. Yeah. I, I mean, I think the other thing is that uh, on the appeals that we thought had merit that we upheld, we, um, at least on one of them that I can remember, we voted to refund the appeal fee. So that's another thing. Yeah. That do we need a motion? I would love a motion. Did we put that as like a, a part of the policy? Is that, you know, if a if someone appeals something and it and it's ruled in their favor, do they get their fee refunded? I think it's just if, if it appeals to the council to do that, then just do it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I can make the motion, but I have to be reminded of what it is. If Mr. Kip would help me with that. Just say so moved. <laughs> I move we approve uh, what we discussed. I think we were at, I can't remember the numbers. It's I apologize. 1,025 500. and it's yeah. 500, 500 in the next category. And there's a provision that a full cost recovery for a commercial project. For the developer. For, for the developer, correct. So moved. Okay. Madeline, you want a second? Second. There we go. And we'll go roll call vote. Thanks, right, everybody. Councilmember Ding. Aye. Councilmember Burnett. Aye. Councilmember Harrington. Aye. Vice Mayor Her um, Agramonte. Aye. Mayor Harvey. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. Do we got it in this for 6.4? Because I promise you that May 3rd is going to be rough. Uh, if we... I can't do it. I got to, I'm sorry. I, normally I do it. I got to prioritize my work today. I can't do it. Okay. The rest of the council, you guys want to do 6.4? Yeah, we'll, I'll go. Yeah, we can't. She has to. I have yeah. to pick a person. It's her appointment. It's her oh. appointment. All right. <laughs> so we're going to go ahead oh, and yeah. move to, move move to, to, to May 3rd. Yeah. Somebody just say the word second. That'd be great. Second. Be great. Well, don't we have to take public comment on oh, it? Yeah, public comment on moving that into to May 3rd. Again, I apologize to all the applicants. Um, it is what it is. It's a mystery. It's a tough, it's a tough situation. So we're in, we're in a bit of a squeeze here and consent calendar went a lot longer than we thought. So um, uh, public comment is open. If anybody would like to comment on us moving this item to, uh, to May 3rd. Seeing no one rise, we'll close it and bring it back to public count, bring, bring it back to council. There it is. Uh, I move uh, that we move item 6.4 to May 3rd. Second. Second. Oops, sorry. Roll call vote. Council Give member Ding. Aye. Council member Barnett. Aye. Council member Harrington. Aye. Vice Mayor Gramonti. Aye. Mayor Harvey. Yes. Thank you. The motion carries unanimously. All right, great. Uh, on item 7.1, any council member reports? I'm going to jump off. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye. Any council member reports? Seeing none. Uh, city manager, I know you had some reports today. You guys okay with a brief report on this? I just I want to talk a little bit about COVID. So that's fine. Yes. Yeah, we got that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I got this ring light now, so I can look more beautiful on the camera. But it is bright in your eyes, man. It is. Uh... And if you wear glasses, you can see the ring. In oh, the... really? It's awful. Yeah. But you look great. You look gorgeous. I look gorgeous. Oh, thank you, Madeline. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Mayor and Council Members, to keep your meeting moving. I, I want to give the community a brief COVID update. Um, good news all around. Cases are falling countywide. We're down to just 20 active cases in Sonoma, the lowest we've been since easily May, June. So that's tremendous. Uh -huh. The county itself 
Uh, we're down to 3.7 adjusted new cases per day per 100,000, which means yeah. we're, we're still in the orange tier, but we're getting a good kick from a good benefit from the metric associated with testing. So the message that you folks have delivered that people still need to get testing has been heard. That helps us a lot. Keep doing that. Okay. Testing positivity is very low, which is terrific. That's yellow tier numbers, um, meaning that, that we're doing a lot of testing and we're not seeing a lot of cases. So again, great practice there. Oh, good. Uh, we're the lowest in the nation and Cal California is the lowest in the nation in terms of test positivity. Vaccinations are quite high in Sonoma County. I bet they're even higher in the Sonoma Valley. But 60% of our population across the county now has at least one dose or is fully vaccinated. 40% of that is. That is awesome. Pretty awesome. Many thanks to the hospital and the community health center. Um, everybody 16 and over is now eligible as of today. Um, there are great clinics going on at the La Luz Center um, Tuesday, Thursday, this Sunday. So um, anyone can go to that. Um, there, we're encouraging the that though to be kind of um, a, a Latinx community priority because that's a community in need. Um, and then uh, I think we are headed towards a nearly full reopening across the California for June 15th, and that means events. And we'll talk about that at the next meeting. Um, I one other thing I want to cover with you today. Um, you guys are follow. Folks may have followed some of the. Um, we we set a planning commission meeting. For the 22nd, it was a special meeting where we were going to talk about the Haven House. Um, that has been removed from the calendar. And my going forward plan, um, and it's just mine, I need to bring it to the council, is that we're going to work on some smaller but important building improvements to the Haven. We're going to update the use permit in a little bit more careful time frame with regular planning commission meetings versus a special. Um, we're going, I'm going to propose to you folks in your budget that you, you'll see for the first time uh, in May that we co-fund with the county a Sonoma Valley homelessness strategy and a plan that looks at the whole valley and includes the whole valley and the valley community um, that analyzes the need across the valley that looks at best practices and that uh, makes sure it lands in a place that respects both the needs of the unsheltered or the homeless and the neighborhood. So I'll stop there unless anybody had any questions about those two things. Questions for Dave? Just jump in. I can't see you. Oh, let me, I'll stop sharing. All right. I'm still wondering, I'm able to discuss with this issue or not, because I'm the board member for the SOS. Uh, the Jeff helped me prepare the letter for the, uh, the, you know, the, for permission to the FPPC. So, because I really have a concern about this because this is the heat of the money was initiated a long time ago, one year already. I really don't know the later why we postponed it again and again. And finally we got the data line. Then the, we went to, you know, lose this kind of chance. And also this is the money based on counties calculation, statute, uh, statistics, how many, you know, homeless people in your uh, city, in your uh, valley, and they located this kind of amount, 295,000. So the, you know, each dollar for us is good. You know, if we lost this chance, this is a grant. We don't have any you know, obligation, pay any you know, interest and all pay back. And the, I, I really don't know. So now I want to just tell you the background and the, I'm in the waiting for the ladder for, for, from the state. I, I know it, this wasn't agendized this way for a full discussion, but I, I really appreciate your points, Councilmember Ding, and I'm happy to talk with you uh, about that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a concern of mine as well. I, I, we didn't land in this place easily. No, and unfortunately, David, I'm sorry that he stepped away, but Amy brought the use permit up, I think, in, in 2020. <laughs> I don't know specifically the date, and it should have been discussed back then. Or maybe it's apples and oranges, I don't know. 
but it sure left the table. That's all. That's all, folks. <laughs> um, great. Appreciate the presentation, Dave. I uh, really look forward to those comments on uh, events. We get a lot. We're getting a lot of questions around farmers market and uh, for the July. Um, so as we get information about that, our, our public is anxious to learn. <laughs> I think everybody is going to feel like Sonoma is back to being Sonoma when we have those two. So um, those are those are the big things here. So yep. um, just appreciate and I have my own music as planned, uh, Mr. Mayor. Pinks, let's get the start party started. A little Tupac. <laughs> I love it. I love it. <laughs> Well, we see if we can get that Tupac hologram they had at Coachella to come to one of our uh, one of our uh, our farmers markets. That exactly. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. Who has taken their pictures? Oh, I'm not. I got to schedule that. I think Logan and I. Yeah. Did you, Jack? I haven't done it yet. Uh, what kind of picture? I don't. It's not on the agenda. <laughs> oh, sorry. Goodbye, everybody. Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Dave, you have more that you would like to share? No, I'm done. I'm done. I don't see City Attorney Jeff Walter, so we are going to go ahead and he never has comments anyway. So we will move for adjournment. At, yeah, that's. I guess that's all I have to say. So thank you, Rebecca. Appreciate it. Have a good night. Thank you, Rebecca. All the to folks who were here for item six. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we had to move that. Bye. Uh, Please come on the, on the third. Thank you. Bye.